a thousand dreams. And this is the spot that has seen many of those dreams shattered. Hello, everyone. Under a cold and cloudy Florida sky, I'm Chris Economaki, welcoming you to our coverage of the Daytona 500. I'm standing just past the start finish line in what is now known as auto racing skid row. For it is right here in the last 10 days that we've seen car after car go awry at speeds approaching 200 miles an hour. For the most part, the physical injury has been minimal, but the emotional impact has been devastating. All this is part and parcel of this race, for the Daytona 500 is the Super Bowl of stock car racing. And for a man to make it through these skid marks and into victory lane is the hallmark of a racing champion. And in 500 miles, we'll know who that champion will be. Well, that's the story from down here. And for more on this great race, let's go topside to my CBS broadcast colleague, Ken Squire. Well, thank you, Chris. Over the years, we've always tried to find something to highlight in each of our telecasts. Often it's been technology, the latest twist and tire design, the newest in aerodynamics. Here today, the story will be people, people we've come to admire, people we've come to care about, people who have contributed so much to this, the great American race. People like the Allisons. Remember one year ago, father and son locked up in that battle to the finish? Bobby Allison winning his third Daytona 500, son Davey coming home a close second. It's different here today. Bobby Allison is home in Hueytown, Alabama, convalescing from a terrible crash last summer. He, like you, will be watching this event on television. He, like many of you, will have a rooting interest in one driver and one driver only here in the 500. That driver is standing by on pit road right now with Mike Joy. Thank you, Ken. Davey Allison, last year, that fantastic father-son finish, but here this has been a very different speed week for you. Well, this has, Mike. Uh, this is the first time I've ever been down to the Daytona 500 without Bobby Allison being a part of it, and there just feels like something's missing. You know, we wish he was down here, but he's at home watching on television, got his fingers crossed for us. You have a brand new car here, the new design 89 T-Bird. Can you put it out front today? Well, we went out and practiced yesterday, and the car ran really good. It, it handled real well. Uh, Horsepower-wise, we're maybe off a little bit, but we ain't giving up until this thing's over with. And we want to put this Texco Have One Star Thunderbird over there in Victory Lane where Dad's Miller Buick was last year. <laughs> okay, thanks, Davey. Good luck. Ken? Well, we've said before it would not be a Daytona 500 if there were not a petty story or two. And this year, indeed, it is a double feature. This was the scene just a few moments ago down on Pit Road. With the petties at rest, Kyle and Richard. It's been anything but a restful week. Back in Thursday in the first 125-mile qualifying race, Lake Speed and Rick Wilson tagged each other and created this 14-car devastation that destroyed Kyle Petty's brand-new car. He's had to buy himself a ride for this 500. And answer to his father, Richard Petty, He's never come up to speed, and the seven-time champion has had to take a provisional starting berth, starting 34th in the field today. Petty Dynasty awaits us on pit road with Dave Despain. Indeed, not since Lee Petty's career-ending crash here at Daytona has this family struggled so much. On Thursday, Patty watched her husband come home in the ambulance. Kyle, with your wrecked car, you had to buy the right to drive somebody else's machine. Why did you make that decision? What was the importance of it? Well, my car owners, Felix Sabatis and Ted Conner, they pretty much decided that uh, the team had worked so hard. Gary Nelson and John and those guys had worked so hard this, this winter to work in 18, 20 hour days to get everything going and everything organized that they deserved a shot to race in, in the race. So, uh, you know, I voluntarily said, hey, I'll drive for nothing. Just uh, give, the, give my part of the winnings to the crew or to whoever and uh, we're going to race. It'll be car number 23 for Kyle Petty. Seven times the headline story has been Richard wins the 500. This year, all the reporters were wondering if you were going to get in the show. You're still changing parts on this troublesome old car. What's the outlook for the 500? Well, you don't really know. Uh, we made some changes uh, just like everybody else did, trying to get a little bit better. And if we hit some combinations, uh, we'll do better. If we don't, then uh, we'll just sort of have to ride around where we're at. But we feel like we've got a pretty good chance to run at least in the middle of the pack and hoping that the, the work we did will get us a little bit closer. Quick question for Linda Petty. You've seen your father-in-law, your husband, your son win races and try to knock down fences at Daytona. Do you ever wish they'd stay home and watch the ball game on Sunday afternoon? Every Sunday. <laughs> at 31 years after the old man Lee Petty won the first 500, they're still the sports first family. Ken? 
Our colleague and good friend will assist us in the call today. And Ned Jarrett, there are so many stories here. Waltrip and Earnhardt seeking to win their first 500. And those new young talents, Rusty Wallace and Ken Schrader, and your own son, who drove so beautifully yesterday. Dale Jarrett almost won his first Daytona race. What kind of an event are they going to produce for us? For many, this is the most important race of their career. Some of them perhaps might try too hard, but they want to show the world what they can do. When you mix the veterans that we have in the field with the rookies and the other hopefuls, I think that we're in for a very exciting race and certainly plenty of competition. NASCAR has done a great job over the years of keeping parity in the cars, which certainly adds to the competition on the racetrack. But if there's one brand of car that has an advantage, I would say that it is the Chevrolet. The body design on that car seems to work so well with the restrictor plates, which are required here. Now, the restrictor plates causes a lot of drafting to be done on the racetrack. And one fellow that might have a little trouble with the technique of drafting here today is Bill Elliott, who broke his wrist in a wreck here about 10 days ago, and he's standing by with Mike Joy. Well, Ned, in the past they've called a million dollar bill. I guess now it's broken arm bill or, or the one arm bandit. How do you feel and how long do you intend to go today? Well, I feel fine, but you know, I just can't do a lot with my left arm, and that's you know, that's gonna be a determining factor. I feel like it'll be better for me to go to the first caution, get out of the car, put Jody in the car, and let him get caught back up and do, it, do the job he needs to do. That left arm's really important for leverage for steering, isn't it? Well, I drive more with my left arm than I do with my right arm, and it, you know, I just as soon broke my right arm if I had my pick, because I could do more driving with my left arm. So fellow Georgian and longtime Elliott associate Jody Ridley will climb into that car, and everybody's saying you're a great pick to sit in Bill Elliott's car because you're not down here to prove anything to anybody. You're just out there to do a good job for him. Well, like I said, I'm not uh, here to prove anything, but I'm definitely going to be trying to win that race, you know, but uh, I'm going to try, try not to take any unnecessary chances, you know, and at least bring the hard car home in one piece, but we're definitely going to be trying to win the race. You're sure not as well known as Bill, but you've had some good runs here. Well, over the years, my finishes have been pretty good. You know, we've been successful about, you know, being around at the end and, uh, uh, you know, having good finishing. So I really feel like even if we don't win, we're going to be in there, you know, at least stop being in anyway. Well, definitely, Jody Ridley will be in there and probably right after the first caution flag. For racing fans, these days at Daytona are a combination of the Mardi Gras of Fourth of July in the Blue Ridge Mountains and a Thanksgiving Day parade anywhere in America. But for the 140,000 gathered here at this moment, just a few minutes before that command to fire the engines. The mood is changing, changing dramatically. Let's join them. We're back with you live at Daytona. Two of the people you have not met are sitting in the front row. Let's go and meet them now. First with Dave Despain. Every driver here has taken three shots this week at Kenny Schrader, and Kenny hasn't even been nicked. You've won the pole, you've won the clash, you've won the 125. Are you concerned that you might have peaked too early, used up your luck? Well, I don't think so. The guys went all through the car. They put another engine in. I'm not by no means going to say it's going to be a cakewalk, but this whole car hasn't slowed down any. Going to try to lead it all the way? We're going to try all far. This is a Chevy. There's another right alongside from the same stable. Let's go to Mike Joy. Dave Crucci, Jeff Hammond's son Colt Lee is nine months old and Friday Daryl's daughter Jessica turned 17 on the 17th. This is car 17 and I know you're just a little superstitious. <laughs> well those are great numbers and uh, you know if you were in Las Vegas they'd win you some money. Daryl today perhaps your best chance ever to win the Daytona 500. Well I'm, I'm awful confident and I just want to go out and run a smart race today. I think that's going to that's going to be the deal that uh, that's just going to be the deal to go out and run smart and not make any mistakes and take care of the car and, and be there to finish and not run in those big groups. I think that's what's going to you got to stay out of those groups of cars. Several time Winston Cup champion but never yet a Daytona 500 winner. Ken. Let's go to pit road for the most important call of the day. And now for the most famous words in motorsports. Mr. Dick Stegemeyer. Gentlemen start your engines. You are riding with Bill Elliott, driving one-handed. He qualified, made a run at 195 miles an hour, one-handed, broken wrist. There's his crew putting up his signboard as he comes down by to complete the first of the preliminary laps, of which there are two. Meanwhile, further back in the field, Rusty Wallace starts 35th. He, too, carries an onboard CBS camera today. Rusty, what's your emotional level right now as you settle down to run for $1,700,000? Well, 
Rusty Wallace, Ken Squire. Do you Sorry read us? got their mic, Keith. Hello, Rusty. Ken Squire here in the CBS booth. Do you read us? Hear me, Barrett? All right, very good. Rusty Wallace talking to his crew starting back in the 35th position. Ricky Rudd is also carrying a camera back in 36. They destroyed their cars in that 125 mile race and had to start new equipment. They brought off the haulers, so they're in the back of the field. The field is out of turn two and headed into the back stretch of this two and a half mile track. We'll listen to the start. Listen to this great facility come to life in just a moment. The weather, it is extremely cool. Winds are at 20 miles per hour right now. We've had 10 glorious days, but it turned cold yesterday. Frontal system moved through. It is a gray day, just about perfect for racing. And now, what all of these people come to Daytona Beach for is about to happen as the field approaches turn three. The start of the 31st Daytona 500. flag and the field is away. And Chevrolet's up in front, nose to nose. Schrader on the inside. Teammates, first time that has ever happened. From the Hendrick Racing Stables of Charlotte, North Carolina. Still even into the back straightaway. Bill Elliott from 13th place. Up behind Jeff Bodine. He's picked off a couple of cars already. Harry Gant and Rick Mays. Coming around to complete lap number one of the Daytona 500. Out in front, breaks Waltrip. It's Waltrip on the point, coming by at 195 miles an hour. In second, it's Schrader. And going to third is the board of Terry Labonte. A great start, Chris. That was one of the finest starts I have ever seen, Ken. They hit the line absolutely perfectly. It's the beginning of a beautiful day. 200 laps here on this track, and right now, Darrell Waltrip is where he wants to be, out of the group. Bumper cam on Rusty Wallace's car. Giving you a low-level view as Richard Petty scoots along up against the wall and clambers through. There you see the 67 car making its move. Mickey Gibbs, one of the rookies in the race. Driving a car that was entered by Jimmy Means. Jimmy did not make it in the car number 52. Has a new sponsor on the car this year, so he put a new number on it. So the car is in the field, but not Jimmy Means. Two laps down. Waltrip out in front. Schrader maintaining that second spot. And Terry Labonte, who won a 125-mile qualifying race on Thursday, goes into that third position. Remember that Terry Labonte ran the distance without a fuel stop. Waltrip did it a year ago not make it off this year. Here's trouble on car number 21, Neil Bonnet, the Wood Brothers car. In trouble, down in turns one and two. Neil Bonnet still trying to win this race for the first time and in serious trouble, clambering out. And the car is on fire, Ken, apparently. Neil is out of the car, but he dropped to the ground. But no caution coming out at this point. But Neil Bonnet's car is off of the racing surface, but you can see there is fire coming from under the hood. Apparently an oil line or a fuel line perhaps broken. He was in a hurry to get out of that car and his broken bones have only recently healed. Could be that the engine let go in his car. Of course, he's away from the racing surface now. He wants to go back to his race car. And the caution will be coming out now. They put the caution lights on around the racetrack and the caution is flying at the start finish line. I believe we can show you what happened here. Dale Earnhardt has fallen from 8th to 17th in those first two laps. 
This is the break for Bill Elliott. This is the caution he wants to come in and get out of his car and be replaced by Jody Ridley. Of course, he won't do that until they race back to the start finish line. The cars get slowed down the next time around. Walter first, Schrader second, Terry Labonte third, Sterling Marlin up to fourth, and maintaining fifth is Phil Parsons. Caution is out, first time in the race. Neil Bonnet, who had such high hopes for today. Back with the Wood Brothers. Well, let's see. We can see Neil Bonnet down on the inside of the racetrack, and you can see flames coming from underneath the car on the left front as he pulls it off of the racing surface down onto the grass area between turns one and two. So he had control of the car. Evidently, I'm going to predict that the engine let go in the car. Tough break. You can see the Wood Brothers who own this car in the pit area. They perhaps don't know what has gone wrong because Neil pulled his helmet off, which, of course, would have the two-way radio in it. The Wood Brothers, who've won this race on four occasions, don't get a chance in 1989. More from Daytona in a moment. Here are the standings after four of the 200 laps are complete with Waltrip, Schrader, and Lavati. The front three, there are driver changes taking place in this first caution of the event. Bill Elliott's car number nine rolled on the pit road. He stepped out. Jody Ridley has stepped into the car, and it's just rolling off pit road. This was the actual change they made. George and Martha Elliott, his mother and father, George and Mildred Elliott, mother and father, watching up home in Dawsonville today. Here's Jody Ridley climbing in to car number nine. It's not an easy chore to change drivers, Ken. There's so much uh, safety paraphernalia and, and radios to hook up and all of that. It takes time. Well, it took a minute and 23 seconds to be exact, Matt. It was a leisurely stop, but one of the things they had to do was to readjust the shoulder harness belt lengths because of the Elliott is quite tall. And Dave Spain is down there with Bill Elliott now. Hold that arm up here. Let's see uh, while you tell us how it felt out there. Short ride, wasn't it? Well, it was a short ride. You know, I really didn't get a lot uh, tired or anything. The arm really didn't hurt. But the problem that I was going to have, if something did happen, you know, and I re-injured this thing, that's why it was critical for me to get out with Jody and give him plenty of time to get caught back up. I know he's in the back right now, but he's got a lot of time to gain some ground back. The early caution really worked to your advantage, didn't it? Well, I'm glad of it because at least they don't put us in a bad situation. The car's got a lap down. We've got a chance to go on and run good, and that's, and that's what we're here for. Let's go down to the other driver change, Mike Joy. Kyle Petty has climbed into the Eddie Beerswall car, Beerswall from Texas. Well, uh, that was a quick ride for you today. Have you broke a sweat? Oh, well, I always break a sweat, but it was a quick one. We we made a deal with Kyle, you know, to get him in the car. We made a deal with him, Felix Boss, Ted Conner, for the peak people, unit people. You know, they were all down here, and they had some trouble getting everything set up for the race, and we had our car in. We didn't have a sponsor that we had to take care of, and they did. We've been good friends, and I think they've done the same thing for us in the past, so we helped them out. Let's go to Dave Despain. Bill Elliott's car has come back on pit road. Jody Ridley now at the controls, and Ernie Elliott is going to make an additional adjustment here, and it's obvious that in the one caution lap that he was able to make, Jody came up with some sort of a problem, something he wasn't entirely comfortable with, and let's see if we can find out from Ernie Elliott what that was all about. Ernie, a second stop, what was the problem there? Uh, nothing, we're just, you know, situating the little things that he needs to be done. You said a oh, car up all week for one driver and then change drivers in a matter of uh, 30 seconds. Now Jody's comfortable at the back of the pack and ready to try to get to the front. Well, Dave, I wonder if they knew that they were given the one lap signal to go when they came around the last time. He's going to have to hurry to get caught up to the field. He perhaps can do it, but the cars are coming off of turn four now ready to take the green flag. But you can see that he's really on the gas. They have not gone a lap down in this car number nine with that minute 23 stop in this 37 second stop. They're supposed to be getting green this time by after Neil Bonnet back with the Wood Brothers for whom he drove from 1979 to 82 and won himself nine races, had trouble in the very second lap of the 31st 500. Harold Kinder displays the green. We're back underway with Waltrip first, Schrader second, Labonte third, Marlin fourth, going fifth, Bill Parsons, and Rick Mast in number 66 of six. Richard Petty down to the bottom of the track, taking three cars on the restart, going into turn one. Remember, he's coming from way back after he had a miserable time in qualifying. Richard Petty can only get up to 186 miles per hour, whereas Schrader was 196. And look how far away the first two cars have been able to break away. Walter and Schrader teaming up together in a draft have pulled away. Now, some of the other cars want to 
try to line up in a draft themselves and see if they can catch back up to them. Stock cars version of the Rock and Roll Express moving out in front from the Hendrick stable by 15 car lengths. Here is Mike Joy with Neil Bonnet. Neil Bonnet, 150,000 people having a barbecue out there. You just had one of your own. What happened? And I came down in a jungle, jungle with something broke on the car, and I smelled raw fuel come inside, and then all of a sudden it just went off. And I had fire running all up in my lap, and I couldn't breathe. They, I think they can rewire it when we get going again. I'm going to have to get back up there, but it just all of a sudden just blazed up inside. Thanks, Neil. Well, that's a very unusual happening, and we can see it again as he pulled it off of the racetrack, and you can see the flames from the left front off that Wood Brothers Ford number 21 of Neil Bonnet. We thought maybe the engine had let go, but maybe they can get him back in the race. The pair that were running as happy as mudlarks and drawing away from the field are getting caught now. The remainder pulling back up on them as they come down out of turn number four, this time to complete nine, nine laps. The 200 to be run. Sterling Marlin right there. Davey Allison is on the fly, too. Allison pulling up. He's in six. Labonte doing a good job in this mix. And Morgan Shepard is showing in the eighth. Bodine is in ninth. Gandy's in tenth. Brett Bodine, eleventh. Mark Martin, twelfth. Kowicki, thirteenth. Dale Jarrett in 14th, Larry Pearson in 15th. Further back here with Ricky Rudd. He tries to sort himself out. There you see Dave Marcus down on the inside as he goes around Marcus on the high side. Here we've got the eight first-time drivers in the race today, 42 starters, and Rick Maft is really an exalted company in that number 66 car. He's up in fifth place, holding his own with the veterans. Ernie Urban now in the pits in car number two. Ricky Rudd is in 26th position. Battle for the lead developing, going into turn number one. Schrader on the outside. The man who won the pole who won the Bush Clash on CBS last week. And Waltrip is falling back a bit. Marlin taking second. Yeah, you wonder if Waltrip might have some sort of a problem. He is definitely off the pace. Phil Parsons comes up to third. He's also out of the draft. It was for a moment. Tom is back in, finds fourth. Has stuck back into the draft, but I, I don't think that car is running on all eight cylinders right now. So here's Schrader, the pole sitter. To win that old triple crown at Daytona. The 125, which he was successful at, and then the 500. Now it looks like Waltrip has picked back up, Ken. It could be that he might have just, uh, the car might have gotten a little loose with him and he thought he had a flat tire and just backed off for a moment to see if there was any problem with it, but he seems to be hanging in there, Chris. It's interesting that that lead that Schrader and Waltrip had built over the rest of the field has been eaten up by the rivals. It's going to be a close race today. There you see Schrader. Trying to win from the pole. It's only been done by Fireball Roberts, Richard Petty, Buddy Baker, Kelly Yarborough, and Bill Elliott. The total was six times. Elliott did it twice in 85 and 87. Schrader trying to add his name to that illustrious group. Dale Earnhardt, right in there behind Dale Jarrett, further back in the field. Earnhardt dropped back, as Chris mentioned, at the top of the show, but uh, now he seems to be back up to speed and That's certainly helping uh, to pull a pack of cards back up to the front back. Earnhardt and Jerry back there scrambling for 14th position. Rusty Wallace in 24th position. Closes up on the back of car number 45, Joe Rutman of Upland, California. Getting an inside view of the back of that Rutman car. As to what's happening as we continue to watch the race on Darrell Waltrip's car, here's Mike Joy. Ken, I think he's doing just as he told us the top of the show, running a very safe, conservative race and waiting it out for the end. He just fired a couple of a place of line and dropped in. Crew Chief Jeff Hammond says, no problem. Let's go to Nathan Fain. Though he never won a race as a driver, Richard Childress has won championships and millions of dollars as a car owner, but now your car has a problem, Richard. What's wrong with Dale Earnhardt? Well, he says whenever he pulls out to go around a car or something, he said it starts to flutter and like it's pulling the air away from the carburetor, so we don't know if it's something in the air filter or carburetor or what. We've had this little flutter and he just won't get out of it. We're going to work on it next bit. No sign of it earlier in the week, no idea how to fix it? No, we, you know, we don't have no ideas right now. We're going to try some stuff on the first stop. Earnhardt stuck out there until the next pit stop. Okay. Earnhardt maintaining that 14th position on the field. Larry Pearson, 15th. Mike Alexander, 16th. Chad Little now in 17th. 
14 laps complete. Richard Petty has moved from 34th to 29th. A.J. Boyd is in 32nd. Jody Ridley, who tail ended the field on the restart, has moved from 41st up to 34th in car number nine. It looks as though Ridley is having a little bit of trouble now that he's caught up to some of the cars that are of speed. He's stuck back there in traffic. He's obviously getting his experience back. It's been three and a half years since Ridley had a start in one of these cars. Well, here and you see him. Get accustomed to the car and the track. He's attacking on Greg Sachs now in the Buddy Baker car. That car crashed in the 125 miler, and they had to bring in a reserve car, so he started out back. Jody Ridley down to the inside of Greg Sachs, and look at this action. There you see Kyle Petty just up in front of Greg Sachs. Situation like this, Ned Jarrett, what's the determinant? Where does a driver the face with traffic like this? Does he go to the inside or the outside? Normally he will run behind the car a little bit and sort of size him up and determine which is the best. Now in this particular case, he just went around Richard Petty, so he followed Greg Sachs because he was in the draft of him, and that helped both of them to move right on around Richard very easily. They're about to do the same thing on the car number. 89, which is Rodney Combs. You know, the, the track here looks so smooth when you walk on it. You see these cars going around the corner. There are bumps, aren't there? Yes, there are. And, uh, of course, the cars are set up so stiff. The springs and the shock absorbers are much, much stiffer than we can see on the passenger car. You can imagine how crack in the windshield developing. You can imagine how tough that would have been on Bill Elliott's hand on the steering wheel of this car we're looking through the windshield of now. A lot of vibration there, and it really would have been tough on that left arm. And as he said, he drives with his left arm. Most race drivers drive more with their left arm than they do with their right arm. Of course, they're going in a counterclockwise position, pull it pulling down. always with that left arm. And you use the right arm strictly as just sort of a steering. It's easier to pull and push. Yes. Is that part of the Economaki School of Advanced Driving Technique? You got it. Schrader first, Marlin second. Back and forth, Darrell Waltrip there, Stevie Waltrip looking on and tabulating the laps for her husband. 17 years he's been here. He's had a second place finish. That was back in 79. Remember when Petty won? He was back there fighting with A.J. Foyt. Came across second, A.J. Looking in on Rusty Wallace again and whoo. Joe Rutman just a little loose there. Collects it, picks it up, keeps on hauling. Well, he's drafting behind the yellow car in front of him is Rick Wilson. It looked like he wanted to make a move. So you see they have uh, fans have asked, do they have maneuverability with these cars going at 200 miles an hour? Well, you can see there that they do have. He can move from one point on the racetrack to the other. Now, you have to be pretty careful not to make radical moves because you certainly can break traction. The steering ratio, Ned, compared to a pleasure car in these cars, so or the, the same. It would be about the same as a car, a passenger car with power steering mode. Most of them would use about a 16 to 1 steering ratio. Some like a little bit slower ratio, maybe a 20 to 1, but all of those are stock ratios that would be in a passenger car with power steering. 14 cars in the lead lap. Rusty Wallace, from his bumper cam, you're looking at what he sees. Back end of Rick Wilson's car. And you're also watching this battle as car number four. Rick Wilson running a 21st, being challenged out here. Trying to move back up after starting way in the tail of the field. Rusty Wallace car. Chad Little started 28th. He's up to 17. 14 cars in the lead draft. 19 laps have been completed. Schrader in the Chevrolet. Last time we will be seeing the SS Monte Carlo here at Daytona. Perhaps I think they're going to keep it around to the end of this year. But it is an old car that is out here in front. It's been 12 races here at Daytona and only won four times. You know, one of the differences in the Chevrolets from last year, even though they're the same cars, are the headlight covers. NASCAR gave Chevrolet the right to cover up the headlights with streamlined material because Ford had a new car for this race and Chevrolet did not. The new
new Chevrolet won't be seen on the tracks until May. And those headlight covers result in a three mile an hour uptick in speed for pole winner Ken Schrader. I wonder if it'll have the range of these cars, the miles per gallon. Here's Mike Joy with a story. Ken, we found Thursday in the 125 mile qualifying race that three or more cars went the distance on one tank of fuel, including Junior Johnson's four. It could mean for the first time on gas, this race could be run with only three pit stops. Now, tires, that may be a different story. Dave Despain has it. For the first time, we may find that the tires will live as long as the fuel here at Daytona because all but two cars in this field are mounted on Hoosier tires. Goodyear came here with a radial tire. It was supposed to be the ultimate weapon in the so-called tire war that we heard so much about during 1988. But two radials blew. Bill Elliott broke his wrist. Those tires, all 4,200 of them were pulled, and the Hoosiers now dominate the field. The key thing about the Hoosier is this. The tire, while not as fast as the radial, is very consistent. Its speed doesn't vary. The new tires are not noticeably faster than tires that have run 100 miles. These tires also ran 125 miles miles on Thursday. If they're good for that on the gas, they're also good for that on the rubber. Bob Newton makes these tires. He said someday people are going to learn they don't need 15 sets of tires to run the Daytona 500. And today, maybe the day they learn that lesson. We'll find out with the 23 laps now complete of the 200 to make the distance in the 31st Daytona 500. It continues to be Ken Schrader out in front. Taking a look at the race summary here at Daytona as we go back under caution. Two leaders thus far, a couple of lead changes, the average speed at 150 miles per hour after an early caution. An incident in the back straightaway involving Davy Allison. You see him coming down on the pit road. He has just rolled that car wheel to wheel. Complete one time over Sidewinder after he hit the dirt bank in the back straightaway, protecting the cars from going into Lake Lloyd. Here's Bobby Hillen, who was also involved in the incident, car number eight. Let's go to Mike Joy. Or Terry Levine making his pit stop. They are changing all four tires, not because of where. They want to check how the tires grew, measure the stagger, and check the tire temperatures. Levine's away. Here's Dave Despain. You don't see a lot of cars that have been on their top make a pit stop at Daytona. Here is one, Davey Allison on pit road getting four tires, and now the crew going to work putting in a new windshield. The hood has been ripped off the car. The damage does not look outrageous. I think it can continue. Let's go back to Mike Joy. Taking a look at the tires stacked up here on pit road, you'll notice these tires are all scuffed. Junior Johnson put worn tires, scuffed in tires on his race car. The Elliots had brand new, unused, what they call sticker tires, ready to go on Elliott's car, quickly changed their mind. They went with scuffs also. Dave? Let's check quickly with Kirk Shelmerdine. He's Dale Earnhardt's crew chief. You guys were stuck back there waiting for the pit stop. You got the stop. What did you do? I'm sorry, what did you say? What were you able to do for Dale regarding the carburation problems? Well, we're, we, we didn't help that problem any at all. We're putting a little better set of tires on there. He said he had a vibration there. Uh, whatever's skipping on the motor just comes in and out every once in a while, and we, we can't decide what it is. We, until we know more about it, we're not going to change it. We'll try to lose a more valuable time. So this team is still in a diagnostic mode here during this round of pit stops, Ken. Let's see what happened to Davey Allison. Turn two, back straight away. Well, he's in the middle of that pack of front-running cars, and all of a sudden, he comes out of it, apparently getting bumped. You can see the hood fly off the cars. He spins around on the grass on the backstretch and then into a bank, and it flips the car over all the way over his four wheels. He has the presence of mind pretty quickly to fire the car up, get it going in. He drove it back into the pits. Well, here we see it from a different angle. As we see it spinning through the grass, approaching the bank of dirt. And when it hits that bank of dirt, it just rolls the car right over very nicely one time and back on his wheels. And he's already back on the track. He has already come back out. That's the speed shot on the back wall here. Now, from Jody Ridley's view, let's see what happened Bobby to Bobby Hillen. Hillen. Bobby Hillen had a problem in car number eight. And here's Jody Ridley. Now, he just uh, put his car up into third gear, and here comes a car number 19 that went out in front of him down into Bobby Hill. Well, that's way after the, the uh, yeah. 
equipment is already there. That's a lap or two later. You see Ridley downshift right away to get slowed down? Yeah. And the air just blew the hood off of Davey Allison's car. It's a dynamic action here. Davey Allison back on pit road as they continue to work on his car. Here's Mike. Bobby Hillen's car shows a little damage to the left rear corner, Ken, just a bit to upset the aerodynamics. They can't get the right rear wheel off to complete this stop. There's a lot of red paint on the right tire of that car, and they're still working frantically on Hillen's machine. Dave Despain? The new Thunderbirds are supposed to be aerodynamically superior to the old. This Thunderbird is not particularly aerodynamic right now. Davey Allison's top has been beat in. They've pounded that back out. The big area of concern right now is under the hood. They're taking up the air cleaner and continuing to work under their tearing work loose some of the hood framework and generally clearing away bent and broken pieces to enable Allison to continue. They are also taping frantically to get that windshield nailed down solid. They'll try to get him back out before the field comes around and will use as many pit stops as they can get during this caution to get that car as race ready as they can make it. We're back with you live here at the Daytona International Speedway where Schrader is now back on the point. And A.J. Foyt, who has been leading for several laps after we came back under a green condition here at the track. We are under caution from lap 24 through 27 for the incident by Davey Allison. And here's the Davey Allison story. He is still running. He's in 35th position. He has not gone, now 34th position. He has not gone a lap down. He is still running in the lead lap after he rolled that car wheel to wheel midway down the back straightaway. The legend and the myth continues of the Allisons at Daytona. Let's go to Dave Despain. And let's see what we can find out about how that crash came about. Radio reports indicate that Davey Allison radioed into his crew and said that crash was caused by Jeff Bodine, Robert Yates, car owner. What did he say on the radio? Well, he just said, Jeff, put him on a row. I don't know, uh, you know, exactly what happened. I didn't see it, but uh, he, you know, he blamed it on Jeff. Did he sound pretty upset about that, or was it a racing accident from what you infer? No, he was, uh, you know, he's upset about it. Um, you know, he'll, we get this thing straightened out, we'll calm down a little bit. They're going to try to get this car as aerodynamic as possible. Let's go down pit road to Mike Joy. Well, I'm in the Jeff Bodine pit with Waddell Wilson. Waddell, did Jeff say that he and Davey got together? Yeah, he said they touched over on the back stretch, and, you know, he certainly hates that Davey lost it. But, you know, the speeds are running, the cars dancing around, these things happen. But Jeff was very sorry that it did happen. Well, nothing intentional. Oh, definitely not. You know, you certainly don't want to touch someone running this speed. But keep an eye on Jeff Bodine as this race unfolds. With the possible exception of his brother, there are few drivers that enjoy drafting along with Bodine in that yellow number five car. Rusty Wallace has just come in very slowly. He had come from 35th all the way to fifth position. And now, car number 27 rests on pit road. And Ken, there's smoke you can see on the left front of the car. And uh, there's some sort of a problem, I guess, uh, and there's a problem with A.J. Foyt's car. He's slowing down up here in turns three and four. A.J. had led for a while, was running third just before he now slowed down. It looked like Rusty Wallace is going back towards the garage area. He's going backwards as A.J. Foyt comes into the pits. Ah, there's a scene you seldom see. Backing up and headed in. Rusty Wallace, who had started out back and charged all the way through. Now he's coming back on the track again. Going to make another crack at getting back behind the wall. Yeah, that's pretty narrow entrance there, and he just was not at the right angle to make it. Trouble. There's major trouble. Car number Turn. eight, Bobby Hillen, has crashed as well as uh, Baker in the number 93. That's Charlie Baker. Caution is out on the track. A.J. Foyt has pitted and gone on his way. Field coming back to the line. Most of the front of the field all pitting. See who takes the opportunity to go out and get five points and lead this thing. Schrader comes in. He had been leading. Sterling Marlin was then in second. Earnhardt in third. Mike Waltrip in fourth. Bodine in fifth. Parsons was in sixth. Darrell Waltrip in seventh. And Chad Little in eighth when this third caution of the day has just taken place. And it struck Bobby Hillen's car number eight. Driving for Harry Hyde. One of the Stavola brothers cars based in Harrisburg, North Carolina. Bobby was the youngest 500-mile NASCAR 
Winston Cup winner at Talladega a couple of years ago in 1986. One of the youngest starters, too. Remember, he came in here at 17 years of age and started driving for Harry Hyde. Harry Hyde told me the other day, you know, when I started, I drove for his grand, I, I built those cars for his grandfather's money. He said, I'm so impressed with that young man. Now I am building cars for Bobby Hillen. Well, there's Baker's car number 93. That's one of the rookies in the race, and they've certainly shortened that one up, Chris. Well, if you look at the back of it, that was a hard, a hard hit to do that to that car. We're at lap 40. Well, here we can see Hillen's car in the wall, just hugging the wall as he goes around. And we still don't see where the Baker car came. I think he tried to dart underneath, got down on the apron, and then came back up across the track and skittered into the wall. Mike Joy. It looks like a burned-up wheel bearing on Rusty Wallace's car. Rusty, what happened? Well, the car was running super, Mike. Coming from the back straight to the front, it was going to be no problem taking the lead. I don't think the car's really running strong, and uh, it burned a dog on the left front wheel bearing out, it looks like. So you'll get back in the race. Yeah, I'll get back in the race, but it'll be a little bit later. I mean, probably about six, eight minutes it's going to take the changes. You prepared all winter and all week for this race. What do you feel? Well, it feels terrible. I don't know what caused it to burn up, but uh, we've absolutely had some type of failure up there. This is a $70,000 race car powered by a $25,000 engine. They have $12,000 worth of hotel bills here this week. They've been undone by a $15 bearing. Up in the 31 degree banking, Bobby Hillen. Those wires are to hold those workers so they don't fall down as they work on the banking. Bobby Hillen's car number eight destroyed here in the 31st Daytona 500. He walks away. Well, it's a tough break for Bobby. He had such high hopes for 1989 and trying to get off to a good start here in the Daytona 500. But we saw him get sort of hit from the blind side earlier on the back stretch and now getting into the wall here. And it looks like his car was demolished. Let's see if we can see what happened to Charlie Baker. Came out of the truck driving ranks. He was a truck racer. I think he just lost it after Hillen had crashed in the wall. Yeah, evidently. And boy, he backed into the wall hard. Many times when you go into a turn, you see a lot of smoke, a car in front of you. The natural thing to, for a driver to do is to hit the brakes. Sometimes that's not the best thing to do, to uh, at least not to lock the brakes so that the car would go sliding around. Of course, Charlie, a rookie here at Daytona, and sometimes he they don't know all of those things. You could see Lee Raymond making a move down to the bottom of the track in that orange car to get away from them. One of the interesting things about the Daytona Speedway we saw right there is that it's self-cleaning. Baker's car had struck the outside wall and then the degree of banking, 31 degrees, let it slide down to the bottom of the track and get out of the way of the other cars. But there is a lot of litter out there. These cars are shedding so many more parts this year when they have accidents and it seems they've shed in the past. Maybe it's just 41 laps harder. have been completed. Phil Barkdahl continues in front now and his third lap under this caution period. Ken Schrader is second. We're back with you live at the 31st running of the Daytona 500. With Chris Economaki and Ned Jarrett alongside. I'm Ken Squire. Just moments ago, A.J. Foyt, who led several laps, retired his Oldsmobile. There you see rolling back to the garage area, the 1972 winner who was in his 26 500. Here's Richard Petty, who is currently running 14th after starting 34th in the race. When a race driver wins a race, he's the center of attention. But as Chris Economaki reports, fame can be fleeting, and the quality of a man's character should be judged not just by his wins and losses, but by the way he is for his family. Watch it like for the woman behind the men who go out every Sunday. Linda Petty knows. You learn that this is your life. This is the way it's going to be. So you learn to deal with what you have to deal with and accept it. And um, if I dwelled on it, I wouldn't be here talking to you now. I would probably be committed somewhere. Turn number four, Richard Petty's car goes airborne, end over end. I seen then what had taken place. So in my mind, I knew that there was no way he could be alive. I don't think there's anything I could say to make him stop. And um, I would not want to, to say, these are my feelings. Uh, that would almost seem selfish on my part. You give up what you love to do because I can't live with it. And uh, 
this happens a lot of times and when two people reach that point usually they don't end up living together very long but uh, you know uh, I just love him and support him and and that's all I can do and just be there and when he's there and um, I say just have the faith that you know he's being looked after here he is maintaining 14th position trying to win his eighth Daytona 500. Standing by is a gentleman named David Hobbs, who you well know, with a young-looking Richard Petty. David? Well, Richard Petty has got many, many fans here. Well, Richard Petty's got many, many fans here, and young John, two-year-old, is one of the youngest here. I think this is Richard Petty fan. I'm assured he's been coming to races since he was six weeks old, and he is an avid Richard Petty fan. We're on top of a refrigerated truck here in the infield, and George is with me. George, you're also a Richard Petty fan, right? Yes, very much so, David. You think he's going to win today? I think he's right where he wants to be right now. George, why are we on a refrigerated truck? The refrigerator's a little taller a little sturdier and you don't use as much ice over three or four days. Well, there's one side of the equation. On the other is Dave. Dave, I believe you're going for Rookie of the Year honors. I've been down here qualifying for about three or four days now. Probably one of the biggest parties I've ever seen. So there we have a great party going on here on the infield. That's the scene from the inside here at turn number four. And we go back to Dave to Spain in the pits. I'm with one of Richard Petty's contemporaries, A.J. Foyt, out early, but after a heck of a run, you led the race. What happened? Well, uh, we lost a shock bracket, broke off the A-frame. I guess that one was running hard there, uh, either bottomed out or something. I knew something there when I went straighter, went under me there. You know, I kind of bounced and got a little bit loose. I come back and saved it, and then finally it just broke all the way off. But uh, the crew did one fine job getting the car ready. It was a brand-new race car, and uh, I really felt like we had a shot at winning the race today because... Like Chris says, you know, maybe he might think Richard and over the hill, but we wouldn't be here racing. We didn't think we could lead it. So coming from dead last today after I had to make an early pit stop, I don't think it was given to me. We had to work our way, and I think I could run with Earnhardt and all of them today. The car was really performing beautiful. 54 years old, you got a lap or two left in you, huh? Well, I hope so. If I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here talking to you. Super Tex is out of it. Let's go down pit road to Mike Joy. Dave, there are some teams that are here that have been together for 20 years that have $2 million plus in sponsorship. I'm in Phil Barkdahl's pits, and Crew Chief Cliff Champion has worked for this team for how long? About three and a half weeks right now, Mike. <laughs> Getting ready for Daytona. They just led the race here under the caution flag. Pit stop gave up the lead for them. They have a big buck sponsorship, too. $2,000 from Bobby Fisher, a beer distributor. $12 from the mechanics on the IROC crew. $22 miscellaneous and free sandwiches from scooters here in Daytona Beach for the whole week. But all the sandwiches are up on the truck. That's big time auto racing. <laughs> it sure <laughs> is. <laughs> Getting set for a restart. Did I hear... A.J. Foyt uh, giving a barb to Father Reconomaki there, Ned. I think the old timers aren't <laughs> hanging together very nicely here. Well, I, I guess he wanted that opportunity. <laughs> and the fact that he had led this race you under bet. green flag conditions had to make him feel awfully good. Baker's car number 93 being brought in. Hillen's car is out. We're going back to green with 44 laps complete. And Rusty Wallace has re-entered the race. The information is that he is four laps down. This caution flag helped them to fix that in a hurry so he didn't lose as many laps. And as they start, Schrader's in first, Earnhardt's in second, Bodine is in third, Darrell Waldrop in fourth, Kyle Petty in fifth. It is uh, Brett Bodine in sixth. And from Rusty Wallace's viewpoint, there you see Davey Allison right behind him in that car that is rolled completely over earlier out here. Look at Davey still attacking. Boy, the, the aerodynamics of that car are completely gone. That has to make it ill handling and certainly has slowed it down. Pulls up on Phil Barkdahl down on the inside. Back with the leaders. There you see Waltrip now in fourth. Kyle Petty fifth. Brett Bodine is in sixth. Terry Labonte seventh. Marlon eighth. Lake Speed ninth. Phil Parsons tenth. Running in 11th is Kenny Bouchard and up to 12th from 34th, Richard Petty. Rusty Wallace's pit stop, 8 minutes, 16 seconds, and he was in another 40 seconds. Four laps down. One hundred miles down, that was the way the field was running. 
opportunity for you to check in on how your favorite is doing as we continue to watch the leaders four car draft up in front. It looks like whatever was wrong with Earnhardt's car has been fixed because he's out there very much a contender now. If you're just joining us Neil Bonnet at the outset in trouble on fire just two laps down Davy Allison crashing a bit later going wheel to wheel and bringing the car back out and not losing a lap. Ken Schrader has been the dominant factor thus far and A.J. Foyt led several laps. We've actually had uh, 10 lead changes. Uh, Darrell Waltrip, Dave Marcus, Ricky Rudd, Foyt, Ken Schrader, Michael Waltrip and Phil Barktal have all spent time at the front of the pack today. Let's check in on Jody Ridley's race cam here in car number nine. See him back with Joe Rutman who hangs right in there today. He has just never been able to get back up towards the front of the pack. After making that driver change, he was caught back in the pack of cars and he just simply has not been able to work his way up towards the front. Remember that Jody Ridley is in there as the replacement for Bill Elliott, who started the race with a broken left wrist. Jody Ridley out of Chatsworth, Georgia. There you see him, George Elliott. He built cars for his sons down in Dawsonville, Georgia, and not too far away over in Chatsworth. And Ken, for the fans that might not know, why would Bill Elliott even start the car? It's for the points, the Winston Cup points. He will get all the points that this car earns today. Now, the money situation, they normally split it up. Jody would probably get most of the money since he's going to drive most of the race. Murphy Ridley was uh, Jody's dad, and he and George both agreed about one thing. They wanted their kids off the highway, but they wanted them interested in cars, and so both fathers turned to racing. Both sons are now in the same car. Here's Dave Despain with Bobby Hillen's wife. Bobby Hillen's wife went to driving school to learn to better appreciate what her husband does for a living. Did they teach you anything in school about the consequences of a crash like he just had here? Well, um, no, they really didn't teach me a whole lot about the crashes, so I guess they concentrate more on how you should drive. We saw him smiling, but I understand he's hurting. What did he say? Yeah, he said that he blew a right front tire, and um, he's okay, but I don't think he's really ever been this hurt. He's um, His ribs are real sore, and his neck, he said, really stretched out real far, and his neck's real sore, and he's just real tight. Are they going to keep him here? Are they going to take him to the hospital for x-rays, or do you know? No, he's going to stay here. He's, he's about to take a shower right now, and then they're going to get the x-ray results back and um, put some ice on his neck. Kim Hillen, Kim Hillen says that husband Bobby is sore but okay. The four car draft is now a three car draft. Let's take a look at the race summary. Seven different leaders, 10 lead changes, very slow, 143 mile an hour average, nowhere near any record. That's been created by three caution periods thus far in the race. The latest involving Bobby Hillen when he blew that tire and Charlie Baker when he attempted to miss. He just lost it down to the bottom of the racetrack and backed into the wall. Ricky Rudd's bumper cam giving us these pictures. That's Michael Waltrip in car number 30, the yellow car coming up on him. That's Rusty Wallace in the white car down on the inside. New wheel bearing, four laps down. Wallace trying to get back in this thing. He was making a tremendous run before the mechanical problem. We're back with you live at the Daytona International Speedway. Two and a half mile high banks and Jeff Bodine has just taken first place. Earnhardt falling to second. Schrader goes back to third. Terry Labonte in the junior. Johnson Ford remains fourth. But the big story at this moment in my mind is that Richard Petty continues to ramble through the field. He is now in ninth position and Darrell Waltrip is falling back Ned. Yes he is falling back. I don't know if he has some sort of a problem with the car or what it is but he is definitely not running as fast as he was earlier in the race. We see one car after another continue to pass him and he's almost at the back of about a 20 car draft. 54 laps complete. There you see the trio up in front and now look at this dice further back. Petty closing on Lake Speed and Phil Parsons. And there's the Kyle Petty number 23. Remember that's the Eddie Beersquirrel car. So the Petties are running nose to tail out here. Here's Dave Despain. 
find out why. When I talked to Richard Petty just before the race started today, he said, we've been so bad all week, we couldn't help but get better. We changed some things on the car this morning. We didn't know if it would help or not, but we figured we couldn't get any worse. We gambled, hoping we'd hit a combination that would enable us to at least go out and put on a show for the folks. 34th to 9th, I'd say that's a pretty good show. What a show the Petties are putting on, running 9th and 10th. Kyle on the outside around Rick Wilson. In the meantime, that flight of three Chevrolets is moving out front and away from the field. They built about a seven second bridge over the fourth place car. Here's Ricky Rudd bearing down on Rusty Wallace four laps back and Michael Waltrip just in front of him. Richard Petty now falling back just a little in this second gaggle of cars. There you see the fourth place car, number 11. That's the new Ford Thunderbird for the Junior Johnson team. Making a stout run and another Ford, Brett Bodine, the Bud Moore car. One fan that's not quite as enthusiastic as some others out here today. Ken, I think Richard Petty might have gotten out of line. He got down on the inside, and boy, he is just being passed by a lot of cars back there in the field. He was almost at the front of that 20-car draft, and now he's going to be back at the back of it with Darrell Walter here in a moment. The threesome up in front. Here's Mike Joy. Jeff Hammond, have you got a problem with your race car? You're backsliding in the field a bit. Right now, Mike, Darrell said the car had gotten extremely loose. It's been a little bit loose on this set of tires we got on right now. And undoubtedly, the stagger or something has changed dramatically because he said all of a sudden, he said he just couldn't hold a 10-acre field. So he just told him to get it on the back of the line right there and hang on till we get a chance to get that ticker set off. He said it just got worse and worse and worse. So we're just kind of hoping to, you know, get that opportunity we don't fall back too far. What are these temperatures or these uh, figures you've been looking at, tire temperatures or stagger matchups? Stagger matchups primarily. I, you know, we'd run them earlier and had them, you know, some idea what they should be. But uh, undoubtedly, he just he called me early and he said his tire sits set of tires was a little bit loose and he said now it's got worse and worse so undoubtedly we have a stagger change going on and the car's just gotten where he couldn't drive it. When one of those rear tires grows in circumference due to the heat that it generates it'll change the stagger or the difference in circumference from the left rear to the right rear and that will drastically affect the handling of the race car. Petty has fallen to 17th Waltrip back to 18th. He really has fallen away. Boy, when a car gets loose, and what he means by that, that the back end that is not getting traction to the racetrack, and it makes it very difficult, especially when you go into turns and also when you're around other race cars. You saw the unknown race fan. Here's one of the unknown pit crew members down here, but I think I know who that is. Looks like Chocolate Myers to me. Here's the front three coming back to the stripe. Those front three, Jeff Bodine and Dale Earnhardt, you know, there's no love loss between those two, and... Back in fourth place is the first four, Terry Labonte, and the interval is, is over eight seconds between that group of three leaders and the fourth place Ford of Labonte. And Sterling Marlin's Oldsmobile up on the outside, the blue and yellow white livery car moving around. Brett Bodine bringing with him the number 55 of Phil Parsons and Rick Wilson, who was in that 14-car calamity in the 125-miler, is also pulling up. Notice the number 11. That is your fourth place car. Right behind him, Sterling Marlin in the Billy Hagan car, which is running beautifully. And here comes Kyle Petty. Kyle down on the inside, whipping through cars. Bodine back in front. Trouble on the back straight away. Car spinning, landing on the inside. It is the number 19 of Ronnie Sanders out of Fayetteville, Georgia. Ronnie Sanders looping his car and coming to a halt. Caution is out another time. That'll be caution number four in the Daytona 500. It comes at a pretty fortuitous moment for all these guys. This is about when they wanted to come in. Yes, uh, especially Darrell Waltrip. He wanted to come in and get a new set of tires on his car. Of course, he'll have to catch up to the field and perhaps and come in the next time around. But many of them just gamble, came off of, as soon as they saw the caution came off of the racetrack into the pits. And some of them take on tires, while others just take on fuel. Well, from what we've seen thus far, Chris, uh, give us your thoughts about the first part of this race. Uh, anything that we see here that really stands out? Uh, two things. The fact that this field was so close up to a point, and now we have three leaders pulling away with a nine-second interval. 
Had this yellow flag not come out, it, it, it may be a blowout for the bottom of the race there. The Chevy seemed to have it right for today on this track. Yeah, and, and those Chevys, uh, their record here doesn't match their short track record. They've always been discounted on super speedways. Right. They've we're only had four wins and 12 performances on the on the big tracks. Everybody says that when they go to Richmond next Sunday, uh, uh, Rusty Wallace is going to be gone in the Pontiac, but it doesn't seem to have it here, the Pontiacs. Here's Dave Despain. Dale Earnhardt's second place car on pit road. Meanwhile, the leader, Jeff Bodine, has gone flashing by. It's a recollection of last Thursday. It looks like they're going to go to right side tires, cleaning the windshield. They're standing by the left side tires as well. Let's go down pit road to Mike Joy. Jeff Bodine finishes up his right side tire change. That's all he'll get while Darrell Waltrip's group puts very needed tires on. Nope, Bodine right behind him is getting left sides as well. They're all on the Hoosier tires. Every car in this race except Dave Marcus and A.J. Foyt who stayed on Goodyear. Waltrip's group continues to work with Bodine. Sneaks out, just misses him by inches, and Waltrip is away. Again, we are in another caution period created when Ronnie Sanders had problems here in the Daytona 500. Let's look and replay at what happened. You can see the car is sideways down on the inside of the racetrack. He hits the grass area, spins around. Hartford driver to have much control at that point. Then he gets back out on the racetrack and stops sideways on the racetrack. Looks like he almost pinched it, but he got in a little too low and got caught down there on the bottom of the racetrack, and away it went. Kicking up a lot of dust as he <laughs> slides through the grass area. Comes back on the inside of the racetrack, leaving plenty of room on the outside for the other cars to get by. If you're just joining us, it's a gray, cool day here in Daytona after some glorious weather. Big weather front moved through yesterday. Here's Mike Joy. Waddell Wilson having a word here with a NASCAR inspector about the lineup. Waddell, your guys look pretty happy with that pit stop. Well, it you know, it was a good stop. We got some new guys on the crew this year, and uh, we've been pit practicing our pit stops. And, and that time, you know, first time under competition, you know, they've done real well, so I was proud of them. Now, did you make any kind of adjustment in the car? Well, he said out front when he was leading the race, it was a little loose, so we did knock the spoiler up just a little bit, but we don't want to take any speed out of the car if we can help it either. Well, moving up that spoiler will give him a little more downforce, but it'll also add drag and slow the car in the straightaway. Dave Despain? Dale Earnhardt fell back to 13th spot in the field with a flutter in the engine, then worked his way all the way back to the front. Richard Childress brought him in for four tires and fuel, but is the car healthy? No, it's still got to flutter, and he says as long as he's in behind somebody or over to the right, it don't it don't flutter. But he says as soon as he pulls out in the air, like to pull down to the inside, it starts missing. So, just as soon as we get an opportunity, we're going to try to work around the cow a little bit. It's like it's cutting the air off up there. If he can get from 13th to second with it missing, maybe you ought to just leave it alone. No, we'd like to get it right. We want to win the race. I think he can win the race if he can keep performing like that. That's Richard Childress. His man Earnhardt is second on the restart. Under Carson, Schrader changed four tires, Bodine changed four, Terry Labonte changed none, and the current leader overall of the Daytona 500 is Rick Wilson. Well, it's an interesting leaderboard after 62 <laughs> laps in the Daytona 500. The Oldsmobile, Rick Wilson, is out in front. The Terry Labonte Raymond Ford is running on. in second. Kyle Petty is in third. Then Rick Mast in fourth, Mark Martin in fifth. And there you see the second 10 with Dale Jarrett showing up in seventh. How do you feel about that, Mr. Jarrett? He made a good pit Young stop and got him right good. back out there. So Elmo Langman and the crew did a good job. And now let's go to David Hobbs. Well, another place to watch the race from is from where you can't actually see it. And I've got with me Linda Petty, who doesn't really like watching these races. Why is that, Linda? Well, I think it makes me more nervous to actually be watching it, like it, the whole thing, than, it, than just to know I'm here. If I need to get to the hospital, I need to get somewhere. I'm right here. I've got my radio and I'm listening, but I, I've never been to Daytona and seen a race. Well, Ned's got one out there. You've got two out there. And right at the moment, of course, Kyle's running in third on the lineup and Rich is 26. How do you feel about that? Well, I'm really proud of Kyle because he's had a tough week down here. So to be up in third place, I, I am really proud of him. And I think Richard's done good so far despite the week we've had. And, uh, you know, if we can just hang in there, who knows? Might be an eighth Daytona. Do you think he's slipping back just to stay out of the way of trouble like uh, Darrell Walsh was saying at the beginning of the race? Well, I don't know. I gave him all kinds of instructions this morning, and um, to I told him how to drive. Of course, I, I don't think he paid any attention, but that might be. Maybe he's just kind of going up there, seeing if he can, and then maybe um, moving back, just getting out of all that pack of cars and just playing a smart race. 
Well, there we have a wonderful woman who's been coming to this race for over 30 years, and she's got two reasons to feel pretty worried out there on the track. Back to you guys in the booth. Richard Petty signed up for the IROC series this year and neglected to tell his wife. She read about it in the paper. He is still hearing about that. We're back under green. There you see Rusty Wallace down to the inside of the break trying to take a lap back from Rick Wilson. And right there in second spot is Terry Labonte. That Ford of his looking really strong. And Kyle Petty has worked his way into third spot. What a comeback he's making in his 500 after his disastrous run in the 125 miler. No fault of his. Two cars getting tangled, Lake Speed and Rick Wilson. He was one of the dozen victimized by those first two cars. And Rusty Wallace is not going to make that lap back. Instead, Terry Labonte puts the Ford out in front. Is that the first time we've seen a Ford in front today? I believe it is. Of course, he won one of the 125 mile qualifying races here on Thursday. Proved that he had a lot of strength there. That's the 10th different driver to lead out here. And look at Kyle Petty dart into second place. Kyle's running a limited schedule this year, just 16 races. Heartbroken back on Thursday, he and his wife Petty, after their brand new car was destroyed. Dale Earnhardt slipping back a bit as he got pinned on the outside out of the draft. You know, Terry Labonte's car on a Junior Johnson was here for 16 years with Chevrolets, and this year he's here with the Ford, and it seems to have put his magic into that car just as he did the Chevys. You see Rick Wilson maintaining the third spot, and here is Rick Mast in the number 66 up to fourth place, that white car number 66. Mast is one of my favorites. Great star of the Grand National Series of NASCAR. Been racing since he was 15 years old. And Chris, he traded a cow for his first race car. It was a 57 Chevy with a blown engine. And uh, I don't know what kind of a trade that was. You know, he's got uh, Mass as one of the only drivers in the race who does not have a corporate sponsor on the side of his car. He's truly an independent in this competition today. Well, here's Rusty Wallace giving us these incredible pictures of the top five. That's Phil Parsons running in fifth, directly in front of him. Mast is in there, Wilson, Kyle Petty, and Levante just barely in front of Rusty Wallace. Here he is sneaking a peek on the outside. You're traveling at better than 190 miles per hour through the 31-degree banking of the Daytona International Speedway. We're live with you this afternoon at the Great American Race. Let's check in with uh, Jody Ridley. Driving the Bill Elliott car number nine. He is up to seventh place at the present time. And isn't he looking good out there? He has the best track position he has had all day. They made a good pit stop, got him back out early, and now he is in the best position he has been since he relieved Bill Elliott in that port. There you see that car number nine wheeling up on the outside. Trying to move back through and making a very good run of it out there. That Jody Ridley machine. He is running very good now. He has driven very conservatively up to this point. That's what he needed to do. Stay out of trouble till they could get themselves a good pit stop and get up towards the front. And he certainly has done that. Meanwhile, up in the lead, how about this? Kyle Petty in number 23 goes out in front. Kyle's in first, Rick Wilson in second, trying to take that lead back. Well, that's remarkable because that's a strange car for Kyle Petty. His first time in it on the track. Okay, let's, let's have a report from Dave Despain. Interesting bit of extra motivation for Kyle Petty today may have helped elevate him to the lead. His car owner is Felix Sabatis. He is coincidentally the co-owner of the new NBA basketball franchise in Charlotte, North Carolina. Co-owner of that, by the way, with Rick Hendrick, who is an owner of three Winston Cup teams. Anyway, Felix bought himself a new Ferrari Mondial. And Kyle looked at the car and said, that's kind of nice. I'd like to have one. And Felix said, well, if you win the Daytona 500, I'll just buy you one. But there may be a caveat here, because keep in mind, that's not Felix's car that Kyle's driving. Kyle wrecked Felix's car, and he's driving Eddie Beerschwell's machine today. David, I understand. $90,000 convertible. Hey, I get in one of these cars to get another Ferrari. In any case, the Rick Wilson car, owned by the Morgan McClure Racing Team. There are four McClure brothers here. They're from Abingdon, Virginia. They run this race team with an Oldsmobile, and back home, what do they do? They sell new Chevrolets. <laughs> Car number three certainly has revitalized itself. 17th a while ago, now running up in the fourth position. Car number three 
the Earnhardt car. You see the lap car in there, making it look like five in the picture of Rusty Wallace. Remember that Rusty Wallace had a wheel bearing problem that put him four laps down. He's trying to recoup one of those laps right now. And look at this gaggle of cars running back there in the fifth position. Kyle Petty falling to fifth, and Morgan Shepard's Pontiac stays right there, a solid six. Morgan is having a dandy day. Raymock Racing Team car, number 75. And Bill Elliott's number nine is in that hunt. Jody Ridley pouring it on. Jody, there's the leaderboard after 70 laps. That was after 70. Now, it's interesting, as this race unfolds, uh, Ken Schrader, the pole man, an early leader, is way deep in the pack now. Staying with the pace, but unable to get up front. And here is Phil Parsons, who's had a third place in the Daytona 500, trying to improve on it. Ought to give him a call. Often overlooked, he is really running a strong race here again today, and he seems to do very well on these super speedways. He feels comfortable on the super speedways, Ken. Of course, his only victory in Western Cup competition came at Talladega, the fastest of all of the tracks. But uh, he just seems to run well every time he comes to one of the high bank tracks. Not to say that he doesn't do well on the other tracks, too, because last year he had some good short track runs. He falls back to second, that number 55. He came here when he was five years old to watch his brother Benny Parsons race. Car number four, Rick Wilson, back to the lead. He's here with his young son, Travis. We've seen him in the hotel every morning. Of course, Travis you're talking is collecting speak. chocolates from everybody he can find out there. <laughs> <laughs> talking about. Uh, Benny Parsons, a former winner of the Daytona 500. He's home watching on television today. I guess Benny probably just couldn't stand to be here to watch him that first race of 1989. From the in-car camera of Rusty Wallace, those laps back, pulls himself right up behind Phil Parsons in second spot. Back in that traffic, Ken, is Darrell Waltrip, where he did not want to be in the middle of a group, as he said before, and it's quite heavy. 72 oh, right car in trouble. Him, it's trouble. Jody Ridley. The number nine car has crashed in the back straightaway. 84, Mike Dale Alexander has crashed. Here's Jody Ridley trying to get it fired. Dale Jarrett getting tagged there right in front and several more cars. A major incident at lap 73. Dale Jarrett's car is down, Jody Ridley is down and several others. Caution is on, Rick Wilson dropping onto pit road. And there's Rusty Wallace getting a lap back. Rusty Wallace has just collected a lap back. Here's the 84. That is Mike Alexander, the number nine of Elliott, the number 28 with a left rear tire down on Dale Jarrett's car. The 89, Rodney Combs is out. The car number 90, which is the rookie driver, Chad Little in trouble. We'll try to see what sprung this incident. Jody Ridley seems all right, car up against the wall, but he must be heartbroken. Yeah, he has to be. You can see that he's very dejected. Dale Jarrett just can't get that car to going. The windshield is gone from it. The left rear tire, as you can see, is off the rim. We're coming off the rim. Car number six, Mark Martin, was involved. He has just pulled on to pit road. There's the Elliott crew, Ernie Elliott, looking up the track. There's not much to look for. That car has soundly thrashed the wall. That crew of uh, Bill Elliott's there, uh, they lost a couple of men uh, to injuries at Riverside, and Bill Elliott put some signs up around Austinville, Georgia, in the fast food places, in the pool room, and in the gymnasium. Wanted crewmen for Bill Elliott's team. And, Let's and take a look at what happened here as Jody Ridley clambers out of the Ford car number nine. See well, he's on, on the, the outside. outside, and the car just all of a sudden veers into the wall. It, it looks hooked. like he might have blown the right front tire on the car because it just went straight right, and then other cars behind them started slowing down and, and hitting each other, and every a bunch of them getting involved in it. You can see Dale Walter went right through it to escape with the skin of his teeth. So did number 11, Labonte. Watch this again, tighter look. Okay, there were three deep Mark there. Mark Martin there. Mark Martin was in the middle, and Jody Ridley all of a sudden just Chad shot Little. into the wall. There's Chad Little in the light blue car in front. Here's Darrell Walter going by on the inside. And here's Terry Labonte coming by the white car, spinning around the white and red car, but he does go on through. Maybe that's not Labonte because I thought it, yeah, here comes Labonte going on through. That was another red and white car that was spinning around. Lake Speed was also involved. From inside Jody Ridley's car, here's what it looked like coming out of turn two. This is the Bill Elliott car. Oh. Slams the wall. 
see the sparks going through the cockpit. He is going to be sore tomorrow, right down to Dave Despain. Junior Johnson's first uh, run in Daytona with a Ford Thunderbird in a long time, 17 years in fact, has produced good results. They've led the race. They come in for a routine pit stop. I suspect we've not seen the last because, as you can see, there is a windshield here. They did not elect to put it in then, but will probably be bringing Labonte back in. There is damage to the front of that car, and in that near miss, he has apparently taken a ding. Meanwhile, just to the left of us, we see the Stroh's car of Mark Martin with damage on the left side. And Rusty Wallace is in between also anticipating another pit stop. It's busy on pit road after this big crash. Fifth caution of the day with 74 laps complete under yellow once again. Gentlemen, let's look again in slow motion at the incident from where Jody Ridley saw it. Here okay. he is Here's right behind right. Morgan Shepard. Morgan Shepard in the car number 75. And they go into turn one. Let's see if he gets touched here. We'll watch we, them as we, they we know Mark went Martin through the trial oval into turn one. Morgan Shepley looked like pulling away, and here comes Ricky Rudd down on the inside of Jody Ridley, and he just shot into the wall all of a sudden. I think he cut a tire down. If the, the inner liners don't seem to be doing the job anymore that they used to do uh, years ago. From our fire ladder camera, let's look again. See, they're three deep there. Chad Little on the inside, Mark Martin in the middle, and the number nine on the outside. And he just shot straight into the wall. And here's Terry. That was Terry Labonte that came down and spinning around. You're here is the right. Michael Alexander car. That was the other red and white car was Brett, Brett Bodine, Bodine that was getting through. And there's so much dirt and dust smoke flying that the others behind them can't see where they're going. To Mike Joy. Richard Jackson owns the Phil Parsons car. He led a little bit, stayed out there. You decided not to pit. Why? Yes, we stayed out for two reasons. One, we it's only been about 12 laps since we pitted. Two, there may be a lot of debris on the track, and if we're going to come in, change tires, we're going to wait till they clean that up. We may pit before this caution's over. So you're not out there counting a little bit of lap money for leading this thing? <laughs> well, we don't mind that, but uh, <laughs> it's just, we don't want to get caught with a flat tire, and there's a lot of debris on the track, we think. Okay, let's go to Dave Despain. The somewhat battered number 11 Thunderbird on pit road for a new windshield. Junior Johnson in the white hair overseeing the effort, and in fact, they are just placing the windshield over the old one and buckling it down. Now, the front end of that car is dinged substantially and has obviously been off in the grass in the Labonte spin. Remember, this car won on Thursday without a pit stop and came back to lead the race here today. But as the rest of the traffic go driving by on pit road, yeah. this is going to drop Let Terry me. Labonte back to the tail end of the pack and make it a long run back to the front for the new Ford Thunderbird body style, which represents such a remarkable change for Junior, who won here as a driver in a Chevrolet and has won championships in three Daytona 500s as an owner with Chevys and is now back in a Ford. Well, we've seen what it looked like. Let's hear what it sounded like from car number nine, Jody Ridley, as he crashed into the wall. The sound of disaster for Jody Ridley. Ned, it looked like he just tried to keep it in the wall. He hooked it up there. You could see him turn the wheel the other way. Yes, he was trying to keep it out there because that is really, once you've hit the wall, that's the safest place to be, is out against the wall, not come back down in front of the oncoming traffic. Dale Jarrett's car has just been rolled back behind the wall, being pushed in. There you see the windshield out of it. Yesterday, your son was battling a half mile away. He had the 300-mile race won. Then he got nailed by a Rusty Wallace driven into the wall. I saw you standing down here by the start-finish line ready to go across the track. What were you thinking then and now? <laughs> well, I'm certainly sorry to see him out of the race here because he had high hopes for a good finish here today. Yesterday, he was very confident that he was going to win the race, and it was very disappointing to see him get hit and knocked into the wall and didn't get the chance to run back to the checkered flag and winding up about 13th. And, uh, I believe that it didn't look like there was that much damage to this car today, so maybe they'll be able to get him back in, but he's already several laps down. We'll be back with more live coverage of the Daytona 500 after this word from your local station and a commercial message. 
Hello again from Daytona Beach, Florida. We are now 77 laps into the Great American Race. 26 cars are still on the lead lap, and there you see the leaders. Phil Parsons, victorious for the first time in Winston Cup competition a year ago at Talladega, is out in front. And the Iron Man, Dale Earnhardt, in second as we get ready to resume. The green is about to be unfurled. Parsons first, Earnhardt second, Waltrip third, Jeff Bodine fourth, Marlon fifth, Schrader sixth, Wilson seventh, Mike Waltrip eighth, Kyle Petty ninth, Greg Sachs tenth, Ricky Rudd eleventh, Bodine twelfth as they shake him up, and Richard Petty is back in nineteenth as they go under green. And Rusty Wallace is right up there. He's got one of his laps back. If he can get ahead of the leader now, there's another caution flag. He'll have two laps back. He's three laps down at the moment. 26 cars on the lead lap, back straight away. Parsons out in front. Young driver is 7500, and there you see Richard Petty going up under Larry Pearson. He used to fight side by side with Larry's dad, David, and here's Alan Kowicki, who we haven't seen much of today, and I think will be a factor before this afternoon is over, gentlemen. Could very well be. He, he says that, that Daytona and Talladega and these tracks are not his strong, so he's very strong on the shorter racetracks, and one, Last year at Phoenix, Arizona, on a one-mile racetrack, but uh, it's hanging right in there, still in the lead lap. And sat on the pole four times last year. The young driver from up around uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Greenfield, Wisconsin, is home. Here's Parsons out in front, Earnhardt in second. And as you can see, the number 17 of Waltrip. And remember, this trio, now in the lead, have never won the 500. The 86 champion is back there in fourth spot. Kyle Petty in car number 23. Kicking his way up through the field, now running ninth, right behind Mike Waltrip. They're two buddies. In fact, Mike Waltrip lived uh, at the Richard Petty home for a while when he first came into Winston Cup racing. Richard and Linda and the gang took him in. He spent about a year there. They said they ate him out of house and all. They're going to have to find a new sponsor if they kept that show. Our leader, Phil Parsons, loves the carburetor play. You know, he, he was third the Daytona 500 and the Firecracker 400 here last year. And he won at Talladega. So he's, he's for a carburetor plates forever for Phil Parsons. Bodine to the inside. Looks like he wants to make a move. And here comes Schrader. Schrader on the inside moving as well. Here's Mike Joy. Quick, unfortunate stop for Mike Alexander. He's driving for the team. Bobby Allison won this race for last year, but now it's Alexander's ride, and the number changes from Allison's 12 to Alexander's familiar 84. They still have to pry some right rear sheet metal away from the tire so he can get a clean run. He's going to lose a lap here. He was one of those drivers that was involved in that crash when Jody Ridley hit the wall. There were a total of six of them. Of course, Jody Ridley, Rodney Combs, Mike Alexander, Dale Jarrett, Blake Speed, and Terry Labonte. However, Labonte has gotten his car repaired and is back out there, and uh, so has Lake Speed, I believe. They're making installment repairs on the installment plan for Mike Alexander, that number 84. He's been in the pits and in and out so many times. Seven cars in this lead pack. Here comes Earnhardt, busting for the lead. First time today, Waltrip coming with him. Dale Earnhardt sinks his teeth in the first place with car number three. Waltrip along for the ride. Bodine into third. You have the three Hendrick cars running second, third, and fourth now as Kenny Schrader follows Jeff Bodine through, or at least tries to, down on the inside. And again, when you can do that, that's a lot of strength, a lot of horsepower under the hood of those Chevrolets when they can dive down to the inside and pull right around. You hear so much hyperbole about how tough these guys are, but that guy in front is tough. Just four or five days ago, here in the tri-oval, end over end, destroyed a car, and climbed out, and one hour later was back in this number three. 190 90 mile an hour end over end flip by Earnhardt into the fence, tore the car up just into little pieces. And here he is right back, running second here now, and as I say, an hour after that incident, as soon as they could have the track fix, he was back out and running. Look at the difference in Darrell Waltrip's car now and when we saw him backsliding through the field not too long ago when he had a mismatched set of tires on the car. They corrected that during the pit stop. He's on a roll right now. It's interesting. Uh, the one thing that Earnhardt really wanted was he wanted a CBS feed put into his caravan at the infield. And the thing that most upset him was that Darrell Waltrip got one. <laughs> and Darrell Waltrip said, he needs to come and talk to me. He says, I know how to bootleg those things. 
You know, watching the action here today, I spent a good bit of last year on the Formula One circuit around the world, and it wasn't until about the sixth or seventh race that we had a pass for the lead. <laughs> We've had 20 passes for the lead so far today. Long trip now first. 190.84 mile an hour average in his last lap. Earnhardt second. Bodine third. This looks like a replay from a race three, four years ago. Here's Phil Parsons in the fourth. Excellent job by Parsons. And Rick Wilson has moved up into fifth. Now, a moment ago, we saw Kenny Schrader coming with Jeff Bodine as they were making their way to the front. But once he got up there beside of Phil Parsons, he couldn't make the pass. And now Kenny Schrader has dropped back from, uh, he's running in seventh position at the moment. And this slower pace, this 190 clocking, is allowing some of those other cars to gather up the front of the field. Well, we said at the top of the show that drafting would be a very important factor here today, and that's what we're seeing right now. A lot of cars running close together, and many of them not trying to make a move. They just want to keep up with the car that's in front of them. Here's Ken Schrader drafting on the car number 94 of Sterling Marlin, and his car maybe a little bit loose at this moment because he he did try to get up there at the front and then all of a sudden he couldn't quite make the pass. Marlin is six and Schrader is seventh. The Schrader's car doesn't have the edge that it had earlier today. And one of those little adjustments I guess makes a difference on it. Well sometimes the set of tires that you put on when we say you know drivers sometimes say I got a bad set of tires usually it's a mismatched set of tires and it doesn't take much just a quarter of an inch in circumference of the tires can make a great deal of difference in the way the car feels on the racetrack. Notice that yellow car in the back. That was one of those cars that triggered that massive crash on Thursday. That's the Rick Wilson number four. He's running three positions back from these two people. There's the bumper cam of Ricky Rudd's car. And you'll see Rick Wilson a little further back here. You see that fifth place standing. His best finish was here at Daytona in the 4th of July race a year ago. He lost by inches on the finish line to Bill Elliott. You know, Ken, when the checkered flag falls today, it may well end the biggest week from a spectator standpoint in American auto racing history. There are more people here today than ever before. Yesterday had a pretty good crowd. Thursday's crowd was amazing. Over 80,000 here Thursday. Here's Dave Despain with Jody Ridley. Jody Ridley has just walked out of the infield care center. Jody, this uh, trip started with a trip into the wall and a blown tire for Bill Elliott. It ended with the same for you. How hard did you hit? Well, I hit pretty hard. Uh, they, uh, some, for some reason, the car broke loose. I don't know if it, uh, somebody took the air away or, or whatever. It wasn't anything major. It wasn't one of the deal where you're going to lose it. But whoever was running behind me, it felt like I, somebody got me. But it was a deal where it's, for some reason I had to get out of the throttle. And then I was just hang on. You were having a pretty good ride, and all in all, it's been a pretty good week. Uh, is that the same reaction you had? Well, the car had been running fine. We're just rocking along there, waiting on a chance to, you know, we really wasn't worried about running too far up front, but just trying to get that. And I'm just disappointed for Bill and the guy, you know. They had this much confidence in me to let a man like this, I guess. You know. Have you had a chance to talk to Bill? No. After a drive like that, are you thinking about getting back into this full time? Well, I wouldn't mind it, but, uh, you know, I, it's one of the deals we just got to do. We just wait and see what happens. That's Jody Ridley. Let's go to Mike Jordan. I'm with Lake Speed, and Lake, it looked like you got a pretty big piece of that over there. Well, we did. It, it wasn't too bad. We almost missed it, but the uh, that Kraft Bullseye Barbecue wins Oldsmobile dodged about three bullets that were spinning through there, but the last one got us. And that, was, that was a shame. The car was running so good. We started way back in the field, and of course, we moved our way right up into the front five cars there at one time. Well, you've wrecked $120,000 worth of race cars this year, one Thursday and one today, and you own those cars. How's your pocket feel? It hurts. It hurts right now, but uh, we'll recover, and it's just not one of those things that if you're an owner and a driver, you know that things like this are going to happen. You don't want it to happen, but, uh, you know, you go out there and sell as much barbecue sauce as you can and uh, <laughs> hope, that, hope that everything takes care of itself. I think we've sold enough barbecue sauce. Uh, you're, uh, you're all taped up here. You look a little like Mr. Spock. Yeah, I'm hoping we'll get back out. The engine's not hurt. The, the car took a lick in the most vulnerable place right there where the oil tank is. We burst the oil tank. So as soon as the guys can put another tank in the car, we'll get back out and see if we can't get some of those valuable championship points. 
There you see the number 83 Lake Speed's car being rolled away up in front of that group of six that are running for first place. Ken Schrader on the tail end of that whip continues to dart to the inside as if he wants to pass. I was thinking about Jody Ridley. Jody Ridley used to drive a 65 Ford Falcon back in Woodstock, Georgia, and that car was built by Bill Elliott. That's how a lot of that started. And of course, the first big car that the Elliotts ever owned. They spent $3,000 on an old Torino. George got a partner. They had $1,500 each, and they got together and got this Torino out, and they hired Jody Ridley because he thought that was the very best driver in Georgia. Let's go to David Hobbs. Welcome from the Sublime to the Core Blimey. I'm now in the Budweiser suite, one of many suites in this new fantastic tower block. Air-conditioned, soundproofed, 40 seats outside for those who really want to get in with the action. Elegant, well-dressed people, the best furnishings, telephone, and of course, a monitor screen for those who want to watch the racing from inside. And of course, some great food. String beans, teriyaki chicken today, country ham, salad, in fact, with the old temperature being a little bit on the low side outside, Ken, I think I might join you here in the block today and enjoy myself here in the suite for a bit. Ken? Hmm. How does he get those snacks? How does he get those snacks? <laughs> Getting back to Jordy Ridley for a minute, which said he hadn't driven in, 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 since the middle of 86, but he's been racing weekends on the all-pro circuit, Bob Harmon's group, and he's won the championship the last two years. Look at Schrader come to the inside and move his way up to third in that maroon number 25. Closes up on Earnhardt. Whatever problem he had there a moment ago, Ken, when he and Jeff Bodine were coming to the front, he sat back there for just a moment and then got a run, and here he goes. Now Earnhardt making the pass for the lead. A cluster of Chevrolets up in front. Earnhardt for first, Raider for second, Waltrip back to third. Everybody else just hanging on to the ropes with the rear bumper here. Now, Schrader helped push Dale Earnhardt by Darrell Walker as we see Jeff Bodine down on the inside, but that's going to cost him. He's going to go to the back, but here comes Schrader down on the inside. Passes with the greatest of ease. Kenny Schrader, Richard Broom team, Dennis Connors, the crew chief over there. Hendrick Racing Stable, number 25. You know, Ken, there's 27 cars in the lead lap right now, and they're running at about 192 or 193 miles an hour on the track, but the race speed is down to 28.2 because of all the slow down. Chris, how many cars do you have in the lead lap in Formula One last year at halfway? We're just about halfway. Well, I, <laughs> not too many. Back straight away. Schrader first, Waltrip second, Earnhardt third. Rick Wilson comes to fourth. Phil Parsons to fourth, Rick Wilson to fifth, Jeff Bodine to sixth. Sterling Marlin, seventh. Looking back, Mike Waltrip is holding eighth. Rick Bass, ninth. Kowicki, tenth. Morgan Shepard, eleventh. Harry Gant in twelfth. Kyle Petty is thirteen. Brett Bodine is fourteen. These are all the same. Lee Black, fifteen. Joe Rutman, sixteen. Terry Labonte, seventeenth is Ricky Rudd. Then Kenny Bouchard, Phil Barkdahl. Here's Bodine in that number five car. And right behind you see Sterling Marlin. That's six and seventh. Here's Terry Labonte. This car seems to be he's in 15th. Seems to be running well after they put a new windshield and made the repairs on it after spinning through the grass when Jody Ridley hit the wall. Joe, Joe Rutman back there just behind him, the 45 is running 16th on the field. Checking the wall. Lap out here for speed. Raider seems to have turned it up a lot. 47 even, about 191 miles an hour. Nice casual Sunday stroll for Ken Schrader. Who qualified for the pole at 196.996 on the pole for the second straight year. Last year that effort totally covered up by one, the Tim Richmond story, to the carburetor plate. But this year, Daytona belongs to Schrader until today. The question is, will the major headline? The item they hold on to in the record books belong to Schrader or one of these 25 other drivers currently in the lead lap or will a guy named Rusty Wallace who has done it before, we saw him do it at Charlotte, make up three or four laps, get himself back in this race. All Those are race. some of the issues to be decided. All the races that Wallace won in the late season last year, he'd been a lap or more down at one point. It's hard to make up here, though, isn't it? Dan? Yes, I, I started to say, it'd be a little tougher to make up last year than on those shorter tracks where he made the laps up. 
the mile and a half track at Charlotte. He did it. He got a couple laps down there. And uh, Atlanta, I don't think he ever got that far back, but he, he really ran strong in some of the shorter tracks. But here, I don't think his car is running quite strong enough. He did get a lap back a moment ago during the caution, but these Chevrolets, now that they've hooked up together out front, it's going to make it tough for anybody to pass them and get a lap back. The only fellow that could run with him was Labonte. He's back in 16th place now. He's got some traffic ahead of him before he can become a contender. Bill Parsons is still hanging in there with them. He's running in the fourth position in the Osmobile, so he's doing a good job of drafting, staying uh, right up there with the Chevrolets. Another Osmobile, Rick Wilson, is in the fifth place. Jeffrey Ryan, another Chevrolet in sixth. You see all six of those there for a moment on the screen. Schrader stays in front. Dale Earnhardt remains second. Waltrip third. Parsons fourth. Rick Wilson fifth in the 31st annual Daytona 500. This Daytona 500 race summary is sponsored by Quaker State Motor Oil, where the big Q stands for quality. Thus far, this race has been run at a very slow speed, 133.092, created by five cautions. The record at this distance of some 245 miles is 179 miles per hour by Bill Elliott back in 1985. They're off the feet in the area of speed. Let's take a look at the attrition thus far in the race. It's building rather dramatically here. First out was Neil Bonnet. Taking a look down through there, A.J. Foyt had a suspension problem, as you see. Jody Ridley in that crash. And a total of uh, nine cars being reported out of the race at the present time. And we're watching Ken Schrader in his fifth performance in the Daytona 500 continuing to lead. Here's Mike in that pit. Dennis Conner is the crew chief for Kenny Schrader. Well, Dennis, you folks just won $10,000 leading the halfway lap. Big cheer went up down here. Say again, Mike. I'll say a big cheer went up down here when you made that $10,000. Well, the halfway challenge is sort of a race within a race, and everybody here is competitive. And we're all, you know, every race for is important, so we just try to do the best we can in all of them. We were fortunate. Came out up front on that deal, and now we got to go another 100 laps. Dennis is the crew chief, and right alongside his wife, Gail, charts the lap. There you see Schrader trying to do what only three other drivers have ever done in the history of this great racing classic. Win. The pole. Here's Allison coming in. He has been black flagged for losing cheap metal. They continue to work on the Robert Yates car falling laps down. Davey Allison roll over earlier. Here's Dave Despain. Davey Allison is in for his second stop in as many laps. The left front fender was ripped away on the previous stop. That was the reason for the black flag. Perhaps more serious is the fact that the left side exhaust pipe has been smashed shut, and they were trying to open that up to enable the car to breathe a little better. Meanwhile, down on the lower uh, left rear, there's a piece of what appears to be sheet metal bouncing loose. Uh, Winston Cup inspector has checked that over and deemed the car ready to return to the racetrack, at least temporarily. Davey Allison giving it a whole effort out here today with not much left for a race car. You know, the vicissitudes of these races are remarkable. Kyle Petty was leading a while ago. His father was up in the top 10. Now Kyle Petty is 21st and his father's 20th. I think it depends a great deal on the pack of cars they get with. When they were running up front, they were running with fast cars. They're both good at drafting, so they were able to stay up with them. But then, the, I guess, during the extent change of pit stops, they got caught back in the field, and as a result, they are running the speed that the cars that they're running with are running. Mark Martin just made an extended pit stop in car number six. He was uh, at least in for a couple of laps. There you see Phil Parsons, who was running in third. Darrell Waltrip is running in fourth. Rick Wilson in fifth. Jeff Bodine in sixth. We're halfway in the race. Let's go to David Hobbs. Watching the race, and uh, we, we're with the peak end for these people, and we're rooting for Kyle Petty. He's my uh, teammate. You do a lot of slamming in your game. What do you think about the slamming they've had so far today here? I think this takes a lot different kind of courage, but I think that these guys are uh, extremely great athletes to do what they do, believe me. Of course, on my right is director of NASCAR racing, um, Les Richter, of course, who used to play a Hall of Famer for the Los Angeles Rams. Les, how's the race going from your point of view? Well, it's uh, been a good, clean, competitive race so far. We've got a lot of race ahead of us and uh, it's nice to have Mike here uh, 
uh, down here to see our sport. He's one of the great ones of uh, all time in football, and it's nice to have him here today. Thanks. Football, is this where they kick the ball around or is this where they throw it? Well, you Englishmen don't know what football is all about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure you two guys do, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of rapping after this uh, game today. What a game is going on, and back to you, Ken, down the other end of the booth there. All right, then, let's uh, take a look at some of those injuries that have been sustained in this race. Uh, there has been a report on Bobby Hillen from the infield hospital. He's been treated and released. Rodney Combs has been taken to the Halifax Hospital Daytona with a concussion. Jody Ridley, as you saw, he's okay. He was talking with us. Chad Little, the rookie driver in the Don Levy car on the Virginia who crashed, he was x-rayed for a possible uh, ankle injury out here this afternoon. Left foot. Left foot on, uh, but they say he's okay. So that's an update on those that have uh, been hurt thus far in this 500. And Ken, the front two cars of Ken Schrader and Dale Earnhardt have pulled away from the third place car of Bill Parsons. So setting up a good draft team there between them and you can see they lap a car and just move around to these there you see the interval Ned. it's a pretty good one I started to say Schrader is trying to do what only fireball Roberts did in 62 and Kale in 84 and Elliott in 85 win the pole win the 125 and go on to win the 500 it looks Ned, like you just can't go out and win this thing on your own you've got to have a second car to help you out. well drafting is so important especially now with the restricted numbers on the cars and two cars working together. Here's Sterling Marley in for a pit stop. They're changing the right side tires. And let's go to Mike Joy. Ned, yeah, this would probably be the first green flag scheduled pit stop of this race. They've had the leisure of coming in under caution all day long so far. Jake Elder, the veteran crew chief, yelling at Sterling to get gone as they've completed that change and full tank of fuel. Back of the way, car number 94. First stop under green, 19 and 2 tenths seconds on the Billy Hagan car. Billy Hagan, the car owner, is up on crutches. In the hospital had a little work done on some cartilage a fellow out of Louisiana who's had a champion in Winston Cup racing a few years back with Terry Labonte right here, here's Richard Petty running further back in the field now the two leaders are putting a quarter of a second more on the third place car every lap they're just they're gone and they're doing that as a result of what we were talking about before we went for Sterling Marlins pit stop drafting close together now Renard's dropped back about a car length or so it, the closer they run together, the better two cars can work and pull away from the rest of the field. Now you can see him dive in, down low on the racetrack. That's what he needs to do to do an effective job of drafting, get right up on his back bumper and stay as close there as he possibly can. The two cars can certainly want run faster than one car by itself. 209 laps complete. Back there on the end of that group, you see car number 66, that's Rick Mass. He's here, courtesy today as Phil Parsons is pitting of uh, a couple of people. One, Dale Earnhardt, who has supported him a long time, and Morgan Shepard. Morgan has been very important in the career of Rick Mass. There you see Bill Parsons on pit road, making his pit stop under a green flag condition. We'll be back to Daytona with more in a moment. We have just crossed over the halfway mark in the 31st annual Daytona 500, where Ken Schrader continues to lead. Dale Earnhardt finds himself in second, Waltrip in third. Rick Wilson, then in fourth, and Jeff Bodine maintaining fifth spot. Coming up later today here on CBS, it's the Celtics and the Lakers. That's following the Daytona 500. Don't miss it here this afternoon on CBS NBA Basketball. Ken, while we were away on the commercial break, as we see other drivers making pit stops, here is Ricky Rudd in the green car number 26. Michael Walter coming back out of the pits. Dale Earnhardt and Jeff Bodine both made pit stops. We saw Bill Parsons in the pits as we were leaving to go to the commercial break. Phil did get back out, stayed in the lead lap. So did Dale Earnhardt. But Kenny Schrader is yet to pit. Now, now, Schrader showing us mileage today. Yeah, now Phil Parsons has just gone a lap down as Schrader has passed him. So. Bill Parsons is hoping that a caution doesn't come out before Schrader has to make his pit stop. Reviewing Schrader first, Wilson now second, Mast reported in third, Alan Kowicki fourth, Morgan Shepard in fifth. It's an update as we get to 213 laps complete. Let's go to Mike Joy. The Ken Schrader crew is ready. David Oliver is already on pit road. He's holding the signboard alongside our cameraman is Mike Slattery, the tire carrier. Dennis Connor goes to the right side with the jack. Henry Benfield puts in that gas can while Mike Henson holds the catch can. Cheech Gard is changing the rear tires while David Watkins works the front. Here comes that second can of gas from Paul Charcot. This is a well-oiled, well-trained.
traveled and experienced through, and they have Schrader in and out, 14.7 seconds. That was a very good pit stop to have changed four tires and to put in a tank of fuel. Now, in contrast, Darrell Walker made a pit stop a moment ago also when we were on a commercial break. He was in for a little over 15 seconds and only took on fuel. He did not take on tires. With the pits, with the pit stops now, with the drafting and the restricted plate, is that going to be more critical then? Well, certainly the, the drafting and fuel mileage is, is going to be critical. It'll become more critical when we get in the last uh, 50 or 60 laps off the race. Well, I think what's important now, if there are no more yellow flag, Ken Schrader's in a great position to win this because he's got enough mileage. It's going to be a close. Mark Martin, Martin has side. crashed. Mark Martin has torn up the Roush Ford. It's in the wall. Well, he has a lap 115. Really narrowed the, the car up. That's the second floor to crash in almost the identical position. That's where the Ridley car crashed as well. You know, it's interesting. All the trouble this week has been dead past the start finish line. We thought that was the Achilles heel of this racetrack, and now today it's all been over there. Well, and it was just three or four years ago that you named turn four Calamity Corner, Chris. It's amazing how the, the trouble spot changes at this racetrack. Well, this is going to be a break for a number of those drivers who had not made pit stops. Rick Wilson now coming into the pits. He had not stopped under Green. And uh, Morgan Shepard, several others. Here's Rick Mast into the pits. We see Rick Wilson with the Osmobile, the Morgan the third team. Here's Rick Mast without a sponsor. They're looking for a sponsor. They can find one. They'll run the whole series this year, but they're going to run the first three races anyway. It's an unusual looking car without anything on its rear flank. Doesn't look right, Chris, to have a car out there without a sponsor in the back. I don't know. I'm sure that there's some sponsors wondering what it would cost to get his name on right now. Well, I'll tell you, it would have been a good time to be on there because he's right up front in the top ten most of the day. He'd probably be willing to pull in, do a little paint work for a second or two. Certainly. The check would have to have a lot of zeros on it. Yeah. Here's Mike Martin. Looks a little stunned as he climbs out of that car. He really took a hit. He hit the wall hard, no question about it. Dave Despain. Two of the three Rick Hendrick Chevrolets are on pit road. Darrell Waltrip comes in directly behind him as Jeff Bodine on the Waltrip car. They go to the right hand side tires. And meanwhile, for Bodine's crew, it looks like it'll be a two, a, a four tire change changing on both sides. Now they come around to do both sides on Waltrip as well. Four tire changes on both those Chevrolets. Bodine is out first. Waltrip a little slow, a little ragged. 23-27 the time on Waltrip. 2282 the time for Modine. Wholesale positions change here on the leaderboard now. Here's Mark Martin who works so hard. He's been doing weightlifting, got to 140 pounds this year. He's always been a very light looking driver, kind of fragile looking. He really looks strong this year. And looks like he's hurt his shoulder as he walks to the rescue unit. Go back to the infield hospital. Replay on Mark Martin's Roush Ford. Okay, it's the head end to turn one. He's the third car in line. It looks like the right front tire must have blown on that car because it veered straight into the wall. We thought Ridley blew it, but apparently he got tapped from the rear and sent into the wall, but no one was close to Mark Martin, so apparently he let go and shot him into the wall. It's obvious that happened, but I just don't understand why the inner liners don't work anymore. It used to be the tire would blow and only go down about half, three quarters of an inch, and the driver could bring the car around to the pits and get a new tire. But now the inner liner goes as well. But in the banking, it always seemed like it went, didn't it, Ned? I mean, you didn't get much you didn't get much help there. Well, when the speeds were much slower than they are now, it, they, it did help a lot. But as Chris says, uh, they just don't seem to work as well now as it was. We'll be back with more of CBS Sports live coverage of the Daytona 500 after this message and a word from your local station. 120 laps have been complete as we come back to you live here at the Daytona International Speedway. And we're just about ready to go back to green for a different look at this green flag restart. Let's go to the man who watches it from the pits, Mike Joy. Every car has a spotter and they're all watching the flagman, Harold Kinder. If you wait for that green flag, you've waited too long. I'll watch Harold's elbow. He gives it a little flip before he tosses that flag. And if my driver's out there and I'm on the headset, I'm yelling go as soon as he moves that elbow right about. Go before you see the flag. Otherwise, too late. Ken Schrader on the get-go. Gone. 1985 Winston Cup Rookie of the Year. Blast back in front of the turn one. 
Lake Speed pitting on that restart. So it is on car number 83. The Lake, of course, had been in the garage area for quite a while as a result of being involved in the wreck with Jody Ridley, but they made repairs and have him back out when he did come back in pit road. Item number 27, Rusty Wallace, running 27th overall, has made up a lap. He has made up a lap. So that now he is two down. Two more down. He lost four laps when they had to replace a wheel bearing on the left front of his Pontiac. Standing, Schrader first, Mass second, Kowicki third, Gant fourth, Earnhardt fifth, Morgan Shepard in six on the restart. Here's Rusty Wallace blazing away. He's picked up two laps. Two more he needs. Well, I said a while ago that uh, it's harder to make up laps here, but he's proven me half wrong, at least because he's made up half the laps he was down. Seen him come from four laps back. Let's see what he'll do today. He's not one to give up. Up in front. Schrader. Ooh. It looked like right in front of him, it looked like a tire might have blown or something. Must have hit a wet spot on the track or something because something just came up all of a sudden right out of turn two. There are the petties together. Further back in the field, Richard is being shown in 12th. I'm not so sure what 23 is going to lap down Kyle. In our latest report, we did not have him in the top 20. And there from Ricky Rudd's bumper cam, you see Richard on the attack, on the prowl, low side of this high bank two and a half mile track. Well, I think Kyle's on the lead lap, Cam. I think he just, uh, he just picked himself up there now. This spot in the standings here? Yeah. Yeah. If 20 cars for the lead lap. If that is true, then he's running in the 14th. Number 17 to the bottom of the track. It's Waltrip attacking another time. Waltrip moving up. He is not with that front group. Traders first. Mast second. Kowicki third. Gant is in fourth. Well back is Waltrip. He's showing eighth. As Phil Parsons getting past on the outside in front of 55. He just wants to get back in line. He did quickly pull back in front of Rusty Wallace. To try to pick up the draft for those cars that were moving around it. Running about a foot apart. Those are Schrader drives without gloves. Most drivers prefer gloves. He's a sprint car driver. He doesn't play with any of that sissy stuff. <laughs> Most of the stock car drivers for years didn't wear gloves, man. But they really, it's a, it's a grand idea with a potential for fire, such as we saw on Neil Bonnet's car in the early part of the race. Yes, more and more of them are wearing gloves now. And you're right. In the earlier days, in fact, not too many years ago, not too many of them did wear gloves. Did you ever have gloves? No, I never wore gloves. Well, I'll take that back. I did wear a golf glove on my left hand, just simply to keep from blistering. I thought you were probably getting ready I, to get out and try your putter or something if the race was over. Well, I don't wear uh, golf gloves when I play golf because I don't play it very well, so. Ricky Rudd, this, this is in replay, and going down to the corner, we're going to see Rudd make an indication to people around. Here's Joe Rutman going beneath him here. And he's motioning to whoever is behind him. Evidently, he feels he's going to have to back off a little bit as Michael Walter went in front of him, and he wanted the driver behind him to, someone was right on his rear bumper, to back off a little bit too, rather than hit him as he went in front of him. Front pack, Schrader, who's won 125 mile qualifying races for two straight years. 1987 over Elliott by about four inches. 1989, I mean two straight years, I mean two years. In 1989, uh, over Morgan Shepard this past year. What do you think is going through Rick Mass mind now? That is he just going to wait here? Does he want to show us some muscle to take the lead? I think he's happy to be where he is right now. Very proud to be. And well, he should be. He's driven a whale of a race up to this point in only his third Western Cup race of his career. And sitting there running in second place in the Daytona 500, following the man who won the pole and doing a great job of drafting and staying right there with him. Rick Mast in 66 told me that when he had this opportunity to drive his first 500, he said, I, I talked to Travis Carter and I had some real reservations, but he said, I detected in Travis Carter's voice that he had a burning in him, and I need someone like that for me if I'm going to Daytona. 
Travis Carter told me this week in the garage area, he said this is a much better team than we have shown in the last couple of years as we pulled our bootstraps up. He said if we could get sponsorship, he says we will show people that we can be a strong team. Again. It must be a bittersweet race for Hal Needham to watch in California who created this team, put it all together. He has since sold the team to Bill Edwards down in Charlotte, North Carolina. But you know how much the Needham loved racing. Well, I'm sure, racing. I'm sure that he's happy to see the car running up there too because he loves Travis Carter so much too. This deal for Mast running in the white number 66 and second is only for three races. Daytona, Richmond next Sunday, and then Rockingham, and then question mark. They'll see if they can go on from there. Well, but the way they're running today, Chris, whoa. Uh, that's got to be an extension. <laughs> I mentioned about Mast. He said there were two drivers, Chris, that were really helpful to him. One was Earnhardt. He said Earnhardt has just done it. He said Earnhardt came down and helped me practice for this race. And he said, and the other one is Morgan Shepard. He said, in 10 years of racing against Morgan Shepard, we spoke perhaps 100 words. And he said, and then when I got this opportunity, Morgan said, I'll go down with you and show you how to get around the track. I'd be willing to loan you one of my cars. And, and the mass said, why would you do that? He said, well, I, I like the way you race. I, I like your style, and I think you need some help. You know, this race had drivers from 20 states starting. Years ago, the Daytona 500 was a southeastern specialty, with dozens of drivers from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. And now, 20 states, and North Carolina still leads with eight drivers who took the green flag today. There's three each from Texas, Alabama, New York, and Tennessee. Two each from Ohio, California, Missouri, Wisconsin, Virginia, and Georgia. And single representatives from South Carolina, Massachusetts, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Washington State, West Virginia, Arizona, Mississippi, and Florida. It's truly national today. The Great American Race. Here's Mike Joy. Larry McReynolds and crew are waiting for Ricky Rudd to pit after we thought he cut down a tire. Apparently not. So Ricky is gambling. That tire will stay up, and he's staying on the racetrack. The last man to gamble like that was Greg Sachs in the first qualifying race on Thursday. Sachs lost that gamble. His tire blew out. He hit the wall and knocked that car out of the race. Let's go to Dave Spain. Where are the pits of Rick Master? A wife, Sharon, is the head scorekeeper here. You got a rookie driver on the racetrack. Is it any more nerve-wracking scoring the Daytona 500 than it is any of those other races? Definitely. <laughs> you acted a little bit nervous, but it must be very reassuring to see the old man running in second place. He's doing a good job. I'm proud of him. If he can hang in there and run this well, what's that going to mean for the future of the Mask family? <laughs> that is a very excited scorekeeper about to watch another lap go by. Let's go back to Mike Joy. And another one, Dave, is Linda Rudd, who's watching childhood sweetheart and now husband Ricky out there. You don't get to see much of the racetrack from here along Pitt Road. Are you more nervous sitting here, or would it be worse if you were up in the grandstand and could see the whole track? I'd be real nervous if I sit in the grandstand. That's why I like keeping the pit laps. I can't see the racetrack, so I like that. And she gets to see Ricky on pit stops, give him a wave. She's charting laps for the leader, who's running 46.89 seconds. And also for Ricky's car, 47.96, about one second off the pace. That helps crew chief Larry McReynolds decide when they need tires, when the car is backing up in the field, and also helps determine gas mileage. 132 laps have been completed. The winner of the Talladega Die Hard 500 you saw on CBS last year continues to lead Ken Schrader. There you see the leading contenders right now with 132 laps down. In the Daytona 500, Schrader in first, Rick Mast in second. Field blazing away, making laps at about 190 miles per hour, but the pace of the race has been slowed by five cautions thus far. Most serious when Jody Ridley crashed hard coming out of turn number two. Now you see a switch in positions for second place. Earnhardt has moved Rick Mast back to third, and he's going after Ken Schrader up on the point. Chevrolet is running in the first and second position here. Rick Mast in the Chevrolet maintaining the third spot. Chevy's continue to dominate the number 33 car. Gary Gant is beginning to really make some headway in this race as well. Having his first Leo Jackson Oldsmobile up in fourth spot. Morgan Shepard is fifth. Darrell Waltrip is back in sixth. Alan Kowicki is seventh. Jeff Bodine eighth. Bill Parsons is ninth. Rick Wilson is in the tenth spot. And you see Darrell Waldrop in that sixth position there. 
And as he comes out, right beside him is Dale Jarrett coming out, many laps down, going for some points in the Cale Yarborough car. Dale Jarrett, the driver. Yeah, he's about uh, probably 60 laps down by now, Ken, but he is going back out strictly for the points. It's a long season, and you never know. Any extra 5 or 10 or 15 points that you can gain in this race might be worth a lot of money at the end of the season. This is also the biggest paying stock car race. A few positions more mean many thousands of dollars before the day is out. Watching Lee Raymond get overrun as the leaders wail by him down into the trioval area. And as David Hobbs was talking to Mrs. Waltrip, Michael Waltrip did come into the pits, and as was reported, apparently he and Richard Petty got together a little bit, so both of them came down pit road at the same time. Michael Waltrip did go back out in front of Richard Petty. I'm just amazed by this run by Rick Mass. And here he is. This is his first Daytona 500. He's been racing since he's 15. He's 31 years of age now. But he seems to have the temper, the temperament to just do this forever. He he looks like a natural. Well, he has the talent, first of all, and, and I agree. I think he does have the temperament. Here's a battle for sixth place. Jeff Bodine moving around Daryl Waltrip and bringing Phil Parsons with him. There's Alan Kowicki beginning to show a little bit of muscle. We said earlier in the show, man might be reckoned with here before this race is over, but Jeff Bodine now moving into the sixth position. Here's Mike Joy. Ken, the pit crews don't get to see much of the racetrack, but they don't need to to know what goes on out here. They have a few clues. These wheels and tires just came off Mike Waltrip's car off that skirmish. There's a little STP red and well, here's a little petty blue. This tire was up rubbing the fender. That's the shiny spots along here, so they had to come in, pull out the fender, get on a new set of tires. There's no way of hiding the evidence when you come into the pit road. <laughs> Ken Schrader stays first. Earnhardt second, Mass third, Gant fourth. More from Daytona in a moment. This Daytona 500 race summary is sponsored by Quaker State Motor Oil, where the big Q stands for quality. After 350 miles of competition, the average speed is, oh, we've got trouble. Car number 73, Bill out of spinning. And you can see people there, and his car turns up on the side as he hits that bank on the inside. You can see the people who were working behind their photographers as they scrambled away as he headed towards them. Now we see the safety vehicles coming to him. So Phil Barkdahl getting in trouble here in the Daytona 500. Well, that's the reason why that speed is so slow. That'll be the seventh caution of the day. Just nicking that wall and getting up on his side. Now this is going to work against Ken Schrader, who's getting great fuel mileage. Had that yellow not come out, and Ken Schrader was able to go another six laps, he would have been able to finish the race on the gas he would take on. Now everybody gets that chance to even up on the fuel consumption. The record for the race was 182 miles an hour back in 1985. So here in 19. 89 is uh, where even a possibility we'll see any kind of problem that these cautions have been out for a great period of time. Here's Dave Despain down on pit road. Second place car, Dale Earnhardt on pit road, right side tires. They'll also go to the left side. Let's go down to Mike Joy. Alan Kulwicki makes a four tire change. Graduate of engineering, the University of Wisconsin, one of two college grads in this field. The other, Brett Bodine. There are twice as many people working on this car full time as last year, so Kulwicki's one shoestring operation is now half the size of most major teams. But he won his first race last year in Phoenix, and he's in the hunt today. From inside, Rusty. We are inside Rusty Wallace's automobile on pit road, cleaning off that windshield, back underway. Getting back out. Here's Ricky Rudd coming out another time. Coming in is Ricky Rudd in car number 26. Kenny Bernstein team. They've had trouble ever since the 125s when they lost their regular car and went to their backup car. And apparently someone heard in Sterling Marlin's pit crew. You can see the part of the Kenny Schrader crew is in there with him as well. We don't know what the situation is. Here's a concern, of course, still on the backstretch with Phil Barkdahl. They have righted the car now, put it back down on all four wheels. And Phil Barkdahl apparently still in the car. 
There's Jake Elder, the crew chief on the Sterling Marlin car, sitting there with the headset on, wondering what's going on. Talking to his driver. Replays. Okay, here's Phil Bart calling the red number 72 on the inside of Rick Wilson in the yellow car on the outside. He goes out into him, touches him just very briefly, and sends him spinning around. Rick Wilson maintains control of his car, but Phil Barkdahl down in the grass spinning around and that bank of dirt coming up, similar to where Davey Allison hit a little bit earlier, but he's hitting at a different angle. The front end of his car went into it, shot it up on the left side. From another angle. Okay, let's look at it here. Phil Barkdahl down on the inside, several cars on the outside, and look how sideways Rick Wilson gets, pushes them down to the way, out of the way of the other cars. That's a remarkable handling job by Wilson. You can see Barkdahl's car come off the ground with the air gun underneath it, showing you how important the aerodynamics are. Now let's down to Dave to Spain. Tommy Dees is a tire changer for Sterling Marlin's crew. As Sterling was leaving the pits, the air hose caught on the car and jerked Dees off his feet and onto pit road. Medical personnel just arriving. The ambulance is here. No word yet on how seriously Dees may be hurt. That's how he was hurt. 146 laps are complete. Thank you, Dave, for that report. And waiting on Phil Barkdahl. It looked like he went in rather easily. And there's an air hose hanging off the back of Morgan Shepard's car. That's going to be costly. Yes, it will. He'll definitely have to come back in the pits. That's a dangerous yeah. whip back there. Let's see what yeah, happened here as to how he came out of the pits with that on car number 70. Understand that we don't have one. We were told that we do, and that's not that is not true. Car number 75, Morgan Shepard. From inside Rusty Wallace's car, let's watch what happened to Phil Barco. Looked like he just moved up. Yeah, got moved out into Rick Wilson, and apparently their tires got together because, as Chris mentioned, his car went off the ground. The back end went off the ground momentarily, and both of them going down to the inside of the track. We can see that Rusty Wallace has already passed and passed the accident, and the others went to the inside. Phil Barkdahl out of Phoenix, Arizona, was involved in that petty crash a year ago here at the 500. We're under caution. Let's see if we can get a word with Rusty Wallace in car number 27. Rusty Wallace, this is Ken Squire at CBS Control. Do you hear us? Again, we'll try to get Rusty Wallace. Ken Squire, do you hear us? Yeah, Ken, I got you. Go ahead. How are you doing out there? You've come two laps in the makeup. You've got two more to go. Uh, a bad break for you. Well, it's a... Uh... You know, we had a left front wheel bearing uh, tear up on us. I don't know if it was a bad bearing or what it was, but uh, the guys got it fixed and the car's running perfect. That last time I got a set of tires that was just real tight and the car slowed down a lot. Rusty, uh, that was a that was a real close call out there for you on the back straightaway. They backed up another 50 or 60 feet. You would have had yourself in the middle of that. I tell you, I couldn't believe it. The 73 car got running pretty good, but I knew it was going to happen because uh, he was running a little bit faster in his capability, I think, and he just drove right into Rick Wilson and uh, and uh, turned her over back there. It's just uh, got to calm down a little bit out here. Can you make up another lap out there, Rusty? Can you make up another two laps out there is what you need. Well, I need to make up two laps. That's right. I just need the caution flags to fall. I got to get up there in the front. I got to get up with the leaders. And when the caution flag falls and they hit the pit road, I got to stay going. That's how I got my other two laps back, and that's what I'm trying to do right now. Well, we'll be following you for the rest of the race. Good luck to you. Well, thank you very much. I hope you're getting some good pictures, and I hope you're all pulling for me. We'll be back with the Daytona 500 and the exploits of Rusty Wallace and all the rest after these messages. We're back with you live at the Daytona International Speedway, completing the 150th of 200 laps this time around on this two and a half mile track. We're under caution. This is the seventh of the day. This has been brought out by a crash of Phil Barkdahl of Phoenix, Arizona, making his second appearance in the Daytona 500. He was here one year ago. It has been a wreck strewn event. It has been slow. And thus far, uh, we have 11 cars that are out of the race for the 42 that started. 26 lead changes among 14 drivers as we prepare for this restart. Rick 
mast in car number 66 from Rockbridge, Baths, Virginia, in his first Daytona 500, 31 years old, is leading the field. Dale Earnhardt, as they come up for green, will be in second. Chen Schrader, third. Phil Parsons, fourth. Jeff Bodine, fifth. Kowicki, sixth. Darrell Waltrip, seventh. Terry Labonte, eighth. Sterling Marlin, ninth. Harry Gann, in tenth. Joe Rutman, eleventh. Kyle Petty, twelfth. Larry Pearson, thirteenth. Kenny Bouchard, fourteenth. Brett Bodine, fifteenth. Morgan Shepard, in sixteenth. Rick Wilson, in seventeenth. Richard Ben Hess is in eighteenth, the rookie. And Richard Petty is back in nineteenth position. And rounding out the top 20 is Ricky Rutt. They are under green. Car number 66, uh, Rick Mass. They made a very good pit stop there, and that put him out front. So Travis Carter is proving that that team has all the ingredients that it needs to run up front. Here's Schrader in third. Chevrolet's one, two, three. For a rookie driver in his third Western Cup race, leading the big the biggest race of all. Last time, Travis Carter, the crew chief on that car, engineered one that has come through was uh, back in 84. They ran the six place. They've had some DNFs currently in the past several years. Here they are leading the 500. Once again, you're seeing the Chevrolets begin to pull away a little bit. We mentioned at the top of the show that they were the cars to beat here today, and certainly they've proven that up to this point. How about it, Chris? Rookie ever come through in this race? No, I thought for a while that Mario Andretti's win in 67 was by a rookie, but if I just checked and he, won, he drove here in 66, except for the first race, and Lee Petty won. A rookie has never won this race. Rick Mast trying to change that in the 31st running of the Great American Race. Earnhardt trying to win it for the first time. Schrader pulls right in there. The fastest man throughout Speed Weeks in the number 25, the maroon car in third. Mast, the unknown, unless you hang around Virginia where they know him well. They knew his father-in-law well. He was the king of the dirt up there for a lot of years. A.G. Dillard won a lot of races. That was his uh, father-in-law. His own dad owned a racetrack. That's a real racing family from Virginia currently leading the Daytona 500. Remember what he said on the Bush Clash? I asked him if he was ready for it. He said he <laughs> drove four cars off the road on the way to the track. Down the he was he ready. Was really ready. <laughs> 194 mile an hour average, and Mast is forcing them, I think, into a pace they might not want to run right now. Cole Wickey going to the inside on Michael Waltrip and brings with him Darrell Waltrip. Michael on the outside of the yellow car. Here's Darrell down to the bottom side, pulling up a spot. Richard Petty back there in the tail end of that top 20. Here comes Rusty Wallace with him. It's quite a picture. Thank you, Rusty. Now, both uh, Richard Petty and Michael Walker for a lap down. They made unscheduled green flag pit stops when they got together a little while ago. Richard Petty, Ricky Rudd, Dave Marcus, 19, 20, 21, and Michael Walter 22. Michael Walter's now being shown two laps down. Okay, he came back in again, apparently. 17 cars remain in the lead lap, and the interesting thing to me is that if the yellow flag does not come out again, the fuel mileage situation, these drivers are going to have to stop within the last five laps for topping off, unless you're a gambler or getting mileage the way Ken Schrader's car has been getting mileage. But I don't think Ken Schrader can go 53 laps. Rusty Wallace still trying to make up laps. It was four down, he's collected two. There's that crack on a windshield in the Wallace car. Not overly concerned with all those braces there. In the old days, it could land in your lap. You can see that radio arrow on the back of Richard Petty's car. He has a, a pretty strong signal between he and the pits. And I guess uh, after driving one of these things for 30 some years that you maybe get a little bit deafer than you would have been uh, Otherwise, and he has to have a strong signal. As a result, he has a little bit higher radio arrow than others. That's scoring tower at work. Richard Petty is, uh, has a serious hearing problem, as do many people in this business, myself included. Richard Petty has given half his hearing, half his life, half his family, and half his stomach to the sport of stock car racing. Incidentally, Chris, we've had a report. Tony Deese was taken.
for the infield hospital. Earnhardt taking the lead. Trader coming with him. Tommy Deese, who was injured on pit road, maybe a leg injury being taken. They put splints on him and took him to the infield care center here at Daytona. And look at Kenny Schrader just drive by Dale Earnhardt. Boy, does he have some horsepower under the hood of that Chevrolet. Fold up the briefcase and sign a new contract, Mr. Hendrick. <laughs> this guy looks like he's gone the way he passed him that time. Yeah, he's led 72 laps in today's race, more than any other single driver in the last Five 500s have been won by the driver who has led the most laps. So things are looking in his favor then. I would think so. If you remember in our show last night, who picked him? Well, I, that fellow with the name of the, the comeback, I believe, picked him. Now, I had been going with Darrell Waltrip all week. I, I felt that Darrell was going to so win this race. And when we did our little little round thing that the fans that saw us yesterday afternoon after the 125-mile qualifying races, uh, I, I switched to Earnhardt because he had looked so strong here in the last several days and, well, not sitting too bad right now. Here's Dave Despain. We're in the pits of now third place driver Rick Bass. And yes, if the rookie wins this race, it'll be spectacular. But for this veteran crew chief, Travis Carter, it would also be sweet satisfaction. A year ago, this was Harry Gant's team. And the Hollywood stuntman Hal Needham was the owner. Needham put it up for sale. Gant left and took the sponsor. Travis tried to buy it, but couldn't come up with the money. And then Bill Edwards, the Charlotte uh, businessman, construction contractor, came into the picture and said, let's keep this team intact. Travis is still the crew chief. Mast is now the driver their third in the 500. Can you guys win this thing? Well, you never know. Anybody can win. We certainly pleased what we've been able to do so far, and we're real proud of Rick's driving ability. Uh, he doesn't seem to be intimidated, and he's certainly not afraid to hold that gas down. I'm, overall, we're really extremely pleased. There's a man who's happy to have his race team in one piece and third place in the Daytona 500. We'll be back with more of CBS Sports live coverage of the Daytona 500 after this message and a word from your local station. Here's how matters stand after 157 laps. Ken Schrader first with Earnhardt second, Mass third, Parsons and Bodine rounding out the top five. Kowicki leading the second five. Harry Gant back there on the end of that, then checking the last group for 10th. 11th back to 15th, Rick Wilson in 11th, Morgan Shepard, Harry Gant, Kenny Bouchard, rookie last year in Winston Cup standings, doing very well. You see we've had 14 lead changes, 14 leaders, and lead changes now number 27. I believe that's a new record. Here are your leaders. It is Ken Schrader first, Earnhardt in second, and Mass driving like he's been here for 10 years in his very first 500, hangs on to third. Chevrolet's one, two, three. Further back in the field lies Joe Rutland. Remember a few years ago, he had a great third place finish. He's now in 15th spot and staying on the lead lap. Rutman first drove a NASCAR back in 1963 out of Riverside, California. He was just 19 and finished a 10th that day. But that third place finish in 82 is the one most remembered. That was right here at the Daytona Speedway, tucked right in behind Michael Waltrip, who's two laps down. Rutman running in the lead lap and currently 15th. His brother Troy won the Indianapolis 500 in 1952. Right now there's less than 100 miles to go. Here come the front three lapping J.D. McDuffie. J.D. who didn't make this race last year back out here and still very much in it with all this attrition it'll be a great payday to Dave Despain. Joe Rutman's a fascinating story in this race, primarily because he's in this race. 15 minutes before the qualifier on Thursday, the engine was out of that car, and Joe was throwing up his hands. They slapped the motor back in. He rolled out on pit road just as they fired the car up and thought one last thing, turned to his crew chief and said, I don't know where the pit is. And they said, we'll stick the board out on the pace lap. Look for us. And remember, we don't have any tires mounted. He went out, got caught in that big wreck, tore the car all up, still finished ninth, and made it into the Daytona 500. Great story on Joe Rutman there. That's some kind of race driver too. I keep waiting for him to have that great day like he had back here in the early 80s. It hasn't come his way. Alan Kowicki back in sixth, sixth place is the only Ford product in the top ten. Uh, Ford lovers reporting for Alan to get a move up here. 
in this 500 mile competition. And Chris, the, the Ford teams and uh, the company had such high hopes for their new body design this year. It is a very racy looking race car. I think they'll win races this year. Maybe they need a little more time to get them all sorted out. Well, Bill Elliott, of course, the tough luck he had was a big blow to the Ford people. And Davey Allison. Here's Mike Joy. Ken, there's one wild card left here, and it's Terry Labonte in the Junior Johnson car, that brand new Ford that went the distance in the 125 mile qualifier on Thursday. Crew Chief Tim Brewer, when I asked him if they had to stop for gas, he just smiled. They were last in at lap 144. They'd have to run 56 laps from here. I don't think they can do it, at least not without NASCAR tearing that whole car apart to look for an extra gas tank, but they may try it. Well, Mike, he's doing drafting right now. He's in a thick pack of cars, but he's running in a draft, and that's the easiest way to conserve fuel at 190 miles an hour is to stay as close to someone else as you can, and occasionally when you're in a position like that, Ken, you can actually back off of the gas a little bit as you go down the back stretch and head into the turn. You can ease off it a little bit and still stay up there with the car in front of you, which, of course, is burning less fuel, but I agree with Mike. I don't think he can go that 55 laps. He went 50 on Thursday. Be very, very difficult. Richard Pett he has only finished one Daytona 500 since his 1981 triumph. That was in 87. He finished third. He's still out here running very well at the present time. But uh, the standings on car number 43 are that he is a lap down. He is being shown 18th. But old 43 still carrying its colors in this race. Well, he had not had that unscheduled pit stop that we saw when they changed all four tires on his Pontiac, then uh, he would still be on the lead lap and right in the thick of it. He was solidly in the top 10 uh, earlier in the day. There is the status of Richard Petty in this drought period he has sustained at Daytona. During the last seven years from 82 to 88, hasn't been very good for him, excepting, of course, uh, 87. Last, last year, uh, Richard Petty's car dropped out of more races than the finish. He dropped out of 15 of 29 events. Well, I'll tell you, I think this carbon monoxide story is, is bigger than than has been talked about. And I'm glad we had an opportunity to bring it forward today. I think there are a lot of drivers as they go on. Your lungs aren't quite the same as when you're young, and it may have a, a very serious reading for these drivers. Well, personally, I'm glad to see that the subject is being addressed because everything that's been done to the race cars over the years uh, to make them safer as far as if they get in a wreck or to make them faster goes against the race driver. They're taking, to make it go faster, they want the aerodynamics on the outside, you know, as slick as they can. They don't want air to get inside the race car, so it's not getting very much fresh air inside. They're building the cars lower to the ground. The heat that comes from the exhaust is about 1,400 degrees, and uh, there's not much room for it to escape, and he doesn't have that fresh air in there to mix with it, so the dri driver's in a very tough position in there now. I think Teddy looks better today on the track and he's looked at a long time and it may be because of that mask and that filtered air he's breathing. Well here he is right behind Larry Pearson. Seems great to say Pearson Petty once again doesn't it? Yeah, it does. It's it like Pearson. 76 and they had that great scramble down here and decided the race in favor of uh, David Pearson that day. NBA next on CBS the Celtics and the Lakers coming to you from California that's right after the Daytona 500. We're going to be running a tad late on this today as we've had so many caution periods. It's a great afternoon of sports on CBS with this great traditional classic. See some 150,000 plus that have gathered here at Daytona, all finding their own menu of one sort or another. And we'll be back with more of the action watching Ken Schrader lead over Dale Earnhardt in second, Rick Mast in third, Phil Parsons fourth, and Jeff Bodine in fifth. More in a moment. This Daytona 500 race summary is sponsored by Quaker State Motor Oil, where the big Q stands for quality. After 427 miles, lead changes still stay at 27. And the average speed is 143 miles per hour. That compares to the 85 record established by Neil Bonnet at around 179 miles per hour. And here you see the drivers now out of the Great American Race, led by Neil Bonnet in the Wood Brothers car that was approaching very early on with a dramatic fire. A lot of crashes today. Still waiting to hear more on Phil Barkdahl's condition after he had a three or four lazy spins and then an easy roll, but they took him off to have a checkup immediately thereafter. We're checking the interval now. 
You just saw the leaders go by, and that's the second group being led by Phil Parsons in fourth place, number 55. Number five, Bodine in fifth, Alan Kowicki in sixth, Darrell Waldrop in seventh, Sterling Marlin in eighth. Dave Despain. Recall that Dale Earnhardt was one of the pre-race favorites, reported a flutter in the motor, and fell back deep into the field. The crew said they wanted to get him some help. They weren't able to, yet he came right back to the front, and he's run there all day. Let's ask Kirk Shelmerdine. Were you able to give Dale any help to speak at? Not really what I can see. He's running a little better than he was in the first race, but I think that's mostly from the draft. Uh, he pulls out of the draft in, in, the, in the clean air, and it runs well all the time. The last bit of help he's going to need is some fuel. When will you bring him in? Uh, probably pretty close to the end. I'll bet it'll be close to the end, and I'll bet it'll be exciting. A game of cat and mouse shaping up on Trip Road. Boy, look at Ken Schrader thread the needle on the backstretch. Greg Sachs down on the inside. Ricky Rudd on the outside. Earnhardt follows him right through. Now, those front two cars, Ken, Ken Schrader and Dale Earnhardt, have broken away from Rick Mast. He has lost their draft and has dropped back. Five drivers have won the Daytona 500 from the pole. Fireball Robert, 62. Petty in 66. Buddy Baker in that tremendous run of 1980. Kale did it in 1984 and Bill Elliott twice in 85 and 87. The question is, can this young man do it? Schrader in his fifth, 500. Mike Joy is with Ann Schrader right now. Ken, when Ken Schrader won the Talladega 500 on CBS last July, Ann Schrader was up in the tower, didn't get to go to victory lane. So she turned down a seat in our CBS suite to watch this race from Pitt Road. You're a registered nurse. Have you taken your own pulse here lately, watching them go around in the lead? Well, no, Mike, everything. You don't look like you get the least bit nervous watching him whiz around here at 190 miles an hour. I don't. He'll tell you that this is the safest place to be. That's victory lane. That and victory lane. That's true. That's true. We just saw earlier some poor pit crew member on Sunoco's car got hurt, and uh, that's the dangerous place. They're hoping to get to victory lane today. Staying out in front, Schrader. Four previous performances, 11th, 33rd, then in 87, it turned around. He had a seventh place finish, and in 88, he was six. Ann Schrader, who we just saw, is very involved with the Winston Cup Racing Wives Auxiliary. She's the treasurer of it and works very hard towards trying to raise money, and they, they do a lot of thing, good things in the sport, and most of the money that is used for injured drivers or injured family members or things like that. Indeed, we do. We miss you, Bobby. Wish you were here today. Hope you're feeling well, Bobby Allison in Hueytown. There are 19 laps remaining to decide the $1,700,000 Daytona 500 coming to you live this afternoon on CBS. Basketball is next. The NBA, the Celtics, and the Lakers will be joining that immediately following the finish of the 500 today. Here is Schrader in first, in second spot, Dale Earnhardt. And those two have drawn away just a bit from Rick Mast. The car number 15 car expired just moments ago and went back to the garage area. Brett Bodine leaving the racetrack but for since, the more team. Since then, Ken, he has come back out on to Pitt Road, and so they're working on the car out on Pitt Road, and he drove it back out there. He coached it all the way around the racetrack into the garage area. Evidently, he got it fired then and has brought it back out on Pitt Road. I think he ran a little lean. I don't know. It could have. He should have been able to go another 10 or so laps as far as fuel is concerned, and we will remind the fans that they have another pit stop coming up before this race is over. This is a deja vu, if you remember Earnhardt and another Hendrick driver, Jeff Bodine, a few years ago, on those late race fuel stops that came down to a dramatic trip. And Bodine won it. 1986, Mark Martin has been x-rayed and released. He's okay. Tommy Deese uh, from Sterling Marlins crew has a fractured leg and has been taken to the Halifax Hospital here in Daytona. He was injured on the road. Here's Ricky Rudd's number 26 following Greg Sachs. Well back, 19th position, a lap down. And you can see the faster cars going by on the inside, Bill Parsons and the car number five of Jeff Bodine. And you saw Alan Kowicki wiggle a little bit as he went by the Crisco car of Greg Sachs, who was running directly in front of Ricky Rudd. 
the inexperience of Mast has now caught him. The two leaders using that draft have been able to snap the whip and drop him off, and he has fallen way back from Schrader and Earnhardt, who are sparring to decide how this 500 will be decided. There you see them, both looking for their first 500 victory. Ken Schrader in the number 25, and the man in black, Dale Earnhardt, three-time Winston Cup champion, but he's never won this one. At one point, this race average speed was down as low as 128 in a fraction of miles an hour. They've brought it back up now to 145.122, but they're running over 190 lap after lap. They both will have to pit once again. A year ago, a flat tire dropped Earnhardt out of competition in the final laps. How will it end today? Cooling off before the finish. 13 laps to go this time around. For the moment, the race is being decided here on the two and a half mile high banks of the Daytona Speedway. But shortly, it will be decided on pit road. That's where this race will probably reach its conclusion. One of these cars will make a pit stop just a quick second before the other, and that will make the difference. Uh, second on pit road, there's Sterling Marlin in. Second on pit road can equal about 300 feet on the track. Another lap put down through the trioval comes Schrader and Earnhardt. The longer they stay out, the less gas they'll need to get to the checkered flag. It will really be a splash. Hendrick Racing Stable in front. Richard Childress Racing in second. Ken Schrader, his fifth performance here. Dale Earnhardt, who's come here for many years come close. Ricky Rudd pitting. Car number 26. Running back in 19th spot. Well, they started to peel off for this last fuel stop. Some of the cars have burned. A lot of gas are already in. Schrader has been getting a better mileage of any other driver on this racetrack, but he doesn't have enough gas to get to the checkered flag. Ricky Rudd back underway. We'll be back for the final laps uninterrupted following these messages. We're back with you live. Schrader and Earnhardt both pitting, coming in at the identical time. Leaderboard Jones, 11 laps to go. Here's Dave Despain. Schrader came in first and brought Earnhardt early. He barely stopped the tires. Let's go to Mike Joy. Schrader stopped a little short of his pit, so he's in here for 6.0 seconds. A longer stop, and look at the distance from Earnhardt back to Schrader on the racetrack. He didn't hit it right where the gas man was standing, and it cost them. 150 yards is the interval now. And that might be tough to make up, depending on who Earnhardt can get to draft. Let's go back to the pits and Dave to Spain. They call him Chocolate Myers, Danny Myers. Have you ever done it better? I don't think so. Was it enough to give him the race, you yeah, think? we got enough to go. They got enough to finish the race, and it looks like they might have enough space to win it. Chocolate Danny Myers, the son of uh, the famous Myers brothers, uh, Billy and Bobby Myers, who were such great racers back in the 50s, both of them deceased now. Johnny Hayes has created a thing called the All Pros, the best pit men in the business, and the pit members are all allowed to vote themselves for the top guy in each position. That ought to give Danny Myers a real crack at it next year as one of those top men over the wall. Here you see Alan Kowicki. Here's Bodine having just a bit of a problem firing car number five, and he's back on his way. Boy, he didn't stay in long. There's the leader, Kowicki. He has not pitted as yet. No. No, it has Dower Walker. Mike Joy. I'm with Richard Broom. Richard, what happened? That's a pretty big pit sign there. I don't know. He just didn't come all the way to us, and it screwed us up. But we, we can probably recover. Well, Ken, oftentimes the driver will worry about oversliding his pit. So Schrader may be on the brakes a little bit early and with an awful lot at stake here, stopping just a little bit short. The eight laps to go this time by. Kowicki stays in front. Waltrip stays in second. Wonder what their range is. We'll find out shortly. These two cars have yet to pit. Alan Kowicki. The young man from Wisconsin who won his first Winston Cup race last year in Phoenix, Arizona, and the number 17 of Walter. They have yet to come on pit road. Will they do it now, or will they elect to stay out? They are running long into the race. 194 laps will be complete this time by, and six laps to go. You 
you heard Ned Jarrett say at the top of the program, five laps to go, that this fellow Kawicki didn't care that much about this Daytona track, but his style of driving, that conservative style of driving, may be paying off here. Working for him today, no question about that. But those Chevy drivers, Dale Earnhardt in third and Ken Schrader in fourth, and Schrader's eating up Earnhardt now. He was 2.59 seconds behind. He's right on this back bumper. It's going to be a battle right down to the wire when those other two leaders go for fuel. Here they are. Earnhardt, here comes Schrader the inside. He is going for third position. Seven and 17 have yet to pit. Schrader pulls into third. And it looks like he might be able to drive on away from Earnhardt and maybe even break the draft. Apparently the leaderboard has gone a lap down of the track because they're now showing five laps. We're showing four. There's the interval. We're waiting for that third and fourth place car to come about. They still haven't come in. appears to have picked up the draft of Kenny Schrader, so he's going to be able to run with him. But Schrader, as Chris pointed out, has just, it, it didn't take him long to make up more than two and a half seconds. He ran Earnhardt down in a hurry, but they still got those two cars out in front of him, wondering, are they going to be able to go that 55 laps on a tank of fuel? Boy, if they are, they've got some engine, man. It's a four down front right now. Four to go. There are four laps to go. Here's and Schrader and Earnhardt trying to move in. The gas mileage master on Thursday, Terry Labotte, one of them at least, uh, just pitted a lap or two ago. So Seven he slowing call. down. 17 is by himself. Evidently, he's out of gas. Kowicki is out of gas. Ran it lean. Down the back straightaway. He's slowing down. 17. Waldrop in front. I think he's going to take the gamble. I believe he will. What has yeah, he got to lose? To go. That's right. The yeah. only thing they remember is first place. Kowicki dives onto pit road. Alan Kowicki brings the number seven down. It's over for him. Mike Joy. Alan Kowicki comes to a stop after running 52 laps on this tank full of gas to win the race. That's over. To count on a good finish, he'll have to put on right side tires. So this will be all too long a stop. An eternity for the young driver from Wisconsin. 13.1 seconds, tremendous stop, but it won't win the Daytona 500. Well, Mike, the maybe the problem was a flat tire instead of being out of fuel because they should not have needed to change tires here with just a lap or two to go. Wallace makes up a lap on the leader, 17. The question is how long has Darrell Walter been out on this tank of fuel? Looking back at the leader, Darrell Waltrip, from Rusty Wallace's camera, final moments of the 31st Daytona 500. Waltrip to the inside. I think he's running on a prayer. <laughs> he's got to be on prayer. I'll, I'll guarantee you he's saying a lot of prayers. Less than two laps to go. Crew standing by. Hoping, praying that that car will just pick up enough gas to go these last laps. To Dave Despain. Our records indicate Walter pitted on 144, same as everybody else, but have had that same 56 laps to go. If there's any magic in there, it's magic that they put in before the race. It wasn't magic on the pit stop. He is drafting all around the track off anyone he can find, trying to conserve fuel. The white flag is out. And Schrader's wife looking on. She can't Tension believe he can go that far on a tank of fuel that Darrell Walter can. He's drafting, trying to save every bit of fuel he possibly can. In the last lap, the interval is immense. It's a question of fuel. Can Waltrip hold out? He could coast in now, I think. Yeah, he's about close enough now that he could coast across the start finish line and still win. Out of turn four, after 17 years of effort, the Daytona 500 belongs to Franklin, Tennessee's Darrell Waltrip. He's done it. He's done it. Second place at stake to the line. Number 25. Schrader will take second. Seven seconds back, almost eight. And right behind him comes Dale Earnhardt. Do you believe it? 
What an incredible finish. Hard to believe that he could go that far on the tank of fuel. Well, a lot of gas tank ever get looked at at the inspection. Mike Joy is down there with a very ecstatic Jeff, Jeff Hammond and Jeff company. Jeff Hammond surrounded by well-wishers. I can't drag him out of the crowd. Hey, Jeff, hey, turn around hey, here. What a gamble and did it pay off. I can't believe it. Oh, man. We we knew whenever Cannon broke away from us that we couldn't catch him. They were running too fast. So Daryl automatically went to plan two and said, hey, let's draft. Just draft everybody and anybody. And we just didn't worry about the speed. We just kept hanging in there. We knew the only way we could win this race. We had to beat him on mileage, and we did. Stevie, Stevie Walter, can you believe it after all these years and everything? Well, it's, it's hard to say what I'm feeling, but I just praise the Lord for, for our victory. And, and most of all, I, I give this victory to Linda Riddle, my dear friend, and I love you, and this, is, this one's for you. Here comes the Orange Tide Chevrolet toward victory lane. Ken Squire. Here's the number 17. Darrell Waltrip rolling down pit road. We'll join him in just a moment. Stand by from Daytona, Waltrip the winner. We're back with you live at the Daytona International Speedway. We'll be joining the Celtics Lakers game in just a moment. But now let's get to the ecstasy of victory. Here's Mike Joy in victory lane with Darrell Waltrip. I'm trying, I'm in the middle of this bear hug. Ken, Carl, and Rick Hendrick. Driver Daryl Waltrip, wife Stevie. Oh, I won the Daytona 500. I won the Daytona 500. <laughs> Daryl, how wait, long? Wait, wait, wait. This is the, this is the Daytona 500, isn't it? You bet Don't it. Don't tell is. me it isn't. Thank God. How many years and how long and how hard have you tried to get right here? 17 years. 17 years this year, and it just took a great. I mean, you saw what happened. Jeff and Stevie and Randy and Rick and everybody, they figured everything right for the fraction. I drafted, 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 and it paid off. 17 years you've been down here. Your daughter, 17 months old, on the 17th day of February, all your car number. I understand three times on the two-way radio, the word came across that you were out of gas. I said, it's gone. It's out. It won't go no further than it. Pick up and go again. But you tell me. I had a lot of drivers say all them numbers didn't mean nothing. You tell me, do they mean anything? <laughs> I guess they do. Daryl, congratulations. Thank Todd, Exxon, and AC Spark Plugs. And Linda Back up to Ken high. Squire. Everybody at home, love all of you. Daryl Waltrip becomes the 19th different winner of the Great American Race. Ken Schrader settles for second, Dale Earnhardt for third, Jeff Bodine for fourth, and Phil Parsons has an outstanding day in fifth place. 